Handle Your High with Teddy Yoshi. All right, welcome to Handle Your High with me, Teddy Yoshi. I have Brandon Curry. Hey, Brandon, how's it going, man? Doing great, man. How you doing? Good, man. Good. I appreciate you staying up late, man. <laughs> I know it's it's uh, late up there. When I was out there, um, it's it is a time difference. What is it like? Uh, seven hours or something like that? Difference from from the states, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, about seven hours, I guess you say. Yeah. For, for me, for me, it is at least, or seven or seven. Let's see, five, it's five, fourteen. So it's probably like seven, eight, nine hours difference. <laughs> right. Um, right. How long you been there? I know you travel back and forth. You train there, and then you travel back and forth. I came, I came here like a few days after uh, this Thanksgiving. Uh, oh, okay, so how much does that, that much, does that put? I know you this last year you did that before the Olympia, and you made some really incredible progress. While you're there, and I've always attributed it to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always attributed to your um, uh, the level of focus that you're able to apply when you're there without any distractions. Um, everyone asked me when I went over there to judge the last time, they were like, oh man, what's the secret sauce over there? I said, man, there's no secret sauce. It's, it's really that you know, you're able to focus. There's like no distractions. Like it's all about bodybuilding. But what's your perspective? <laughs> yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, you know, it's the kind of environment to where you, know, you kind of detach away from everything and you, you really get to the business of bodybuilding. Uh, it's, uh, you know, everything's here that you need for bodybuilding. You don't have to worry about searching for this, searching for that. You know, I live right next door to the gym. I get my food delivered uh, pretty much every day. It's smart. <laughs> but, uh, you yeah. know, the coach is right here on call, you know, he's checking on me whenever he needs to. Sager, who does all that eat smart stuff. Sager, he's a yeah. great guy. Man, that dude's awesome. I love him. And uh, he, he uh, treated us out some, some of his food there. Great food, man. Like, he needs to bring that. I told him he needs to bring that shit to the U.S. <laughs> yeah, man. He's, he's spreading around the Middle East, man. I know he's got us. He went to Saudi Arabia, like, last year. I went out there with him to an event where he opened the store out there. So, yeah, he's, he's kind of spreading around the Middle East like batteries with oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're kind of keeping it on this side for now, I guess. You uh, so how many months are you gonna be there after the Arnold? Are you gonna go back home and spend some time with the family? Yeah, yeah once I get to the U.S. for the Arnold, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna go right back home after the show and hang out till you know summertime for our, for my Olympia prep. You know, I I didn't I guess this prep is no longer than like uh, 12 weeks. Okay. So it's, you know it's not too bad. Uh, it's just, you know about getting business done and uh, focus and then get back home and enjoy the family. You know, you kind of appreciate. Uh, you know, being home when I'm home and when I'm away, you know, it's not for business. You know? Does it, um, what's the biggest challenge for you being over there? Is it being away from the family or is it, uh, or something, is there something else that like, would, that you didn't expect? Like, I'm sure you knew, okay, it's going to be tough. <laughs> but in, in some respects, some respects, it'll probably, it's probably easier. But uh, other... well, well, I guess the greatest challenge here yeah, is, is, you know, those, uh, those significant moments that, you know, you're not necessarily there for. That you maybe miss out on, you know, you only get to maybe see on on the video or Skype or you know FaceTime or whatever it may be. You know, you kind of you kind of miss a little, you got out of the loop. And you know, luckily, my wife kind of keeps me informed, so I'm not too far out of the loop. She's always updating me, or my daughter's getting videos of this and videos of that. So, you know, I seen uh, I miss uh, I guess most of wrestling season. Oh, football season. I caught the most football season with my boys, so that was good. So I'll be back for a soccer season, and hopefully I'll catch the end of wrestling season. So. Wow, you 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 have your children. You have two. You have two boys, right? Or? Yeah, I have three boys. Okay, one da- one daughter. One daughter. So you are they all in sports? Like that's a lot of sports, man. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody everybody's pretty much in sports. My youngest is five. He just started wrestling this year, so wrestling was his first. Oh his wow, first. five. Well, he's gonna be a yeah. superstar then. <laughs> You know, he got to get two of his brothers uh, involved, so it kind of, you know, they may not want to, but you know, once they get out there, it's like you're not gonna sit here and bug me all practice. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta do something, you know. So they eventually, you know, get out there, get out of this shell, and, you know, have some fun. So, is that? Did you start off in other sports? I never asked you that. If you ever started off in uh, other sports like football or? Well, you know, well, back in the day, I was. I guess I was born in the era where they were trying to give all the. All the active kids riddling, all the active boys riddling. Oh, uh, right, yeah. They took me to the, you know, they tried to do that. My my, my parents, my mom and dad wouldn't have me. Were they, were they diagnosed with, like, ADD or something? Yeah, they tried, you know, that's just before they even had a diagnosis. They, you you were, you're were like one of the most chill guys I know, man. <laughs> it, was, it was like, it was like, but I was a hyperactive kid, you know. I was always busy. I was always, you know, into stuff. So they, they, they saw that and they wanted to give me the, the riddling, the medication. And my parents were like, nah. 
So they just put me in gymnastics at an early age. Oh, so gymnastics. Really? Wow. Yeah. So you like on the pummel horse or like the rings or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, just look that and tumbling and body control. I think it's one of the, like the best things for kids actually growing up. Actually, my son's kind of started there as well. It's just good for just body awareness all together. But from there, you know, you get into school. I, I wrestled in middle school, played football, middle school, uh, ran track in high school football. Oh. I've done everything from grappling and, you know, I've always been – what, so going from all those kinds of sports, those are really kind of team-based sports. Like bodybuilding is really an individual, like an individual sport, almost, uh, pretty much. Uh, what moved you to that? I'm just, I've never asked you that question, but what moved you to from these other things to bodybuilding? What, what made you so, gravitate you know, to? After, uh, after I, was, I was in college and I was playing football, I got, you know, I got the wake-up call with the politics. So in football, and I wanted to play now. You know, I was impatient, didn't want to wait. So I wanted to play now. So I kind of was pissed. And then I got caught up in, you know, some, I got, I was, I was like, let's see, put it this way. I was in a situation where I was very well taken care of in college. So I, I, I really didn't, I really didn't need to uh, live the college life, so to speak, that, you know, <laughs> you know, the struggle, I guess you would say. But so I got away from football and, and I had this girlfriend at the time, she took me to the gyms around town, just like to train, found this nice little hole in the wall spot. Where I started, you know, that's where I started bodybuilding. It was a powerlifting gym at the time. Oh. But I started bodybuilding there because uh, the guy, one of the trainers, was he was bugging me like for a month. He was bugging me about competing. <laughs> he asked about five times. I was, I was like, no. I told him no every time. And I guess the last time I had time to think about it, it was apparently it was about four weeks out from the show. And I said, you know, I'm in here training. I might as well do something with it. Really? So he showed me how to pose. Yeah, he showed me how to pose. And he gave me this low-carb diet. And, uh. And I went in and won, man. I went in and won my uh, first show. I won the, the novice, the middleweight, and overall the first show. It was on my campus, so it was convenient. Where was this at? It was uh, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee State. Uh, I think it was a nat Supernatural Bodybuilding Federation. Oh, time. nice. So, so I, <laughs> I didn't know anything about uh, about bodybuilding, but they kind of kind of pushed me into it, and you know, and then I was hooked. So. Yeah, that's kind of how it happened. Wow, that's a, I mean, we all, we all get involved in it for various reasons. Um, I got involved because I was like, had self-esteem issues and I thought it was my gateway to like being, to you know, to really feeling good about myself. But, and I thought it would like solve all my problems, of course, just creates more problems. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it did teach me, it did, it did put me on a path uh, that, I'm, that I appreciate today, a path of learning, a path of growth. Personally and physically, but uh, what kind? Of, what have you? Has this? Has bodybuilding been put you on a kind of a path of discovering more about yourself? Yeah, I, people ask me about. What, they ask me, so what is bodybuilding? To you? What is it? What is it? I said basically, it's a journey of self discovery. You know, because, absolutely. You know, even, even though I was, you know, I was naturally caught on good, had genetics. You eventually reach a level to where you know you're gonna meet competition. You're gonna meet guys that are just mm -hmm. as talented as you are, and you know, you don't pick up those fundamental skills of discipline, you know, hard work and, uh, you know, and you just, and you, you know, you don't develop that tough skin and be able to be judged and be able to, you know, people to just look at you and critique you. If you don't develop that resistance to that and respect for, respect it for what it is, it could just tear you down like mentally. So that mental toughness of body movement builds and, you know, that's just desire to get better and uh, practice discipline. I mean, it can carry you a long way. I mean, I, I've seen guys out here that can't they can't deal with these circumstances. <laughs> they, they find the loopholes, you know, excuses to eat what they want. Really? You know, they want to train. You know, they don't, you know they think they know everything about their body. The coach can't tell them nothing. You know. Oh wow. So I mean, it don't matter where you are, what kind of environment you are. If you don't have to pick up the, the necessarily distance of, of the sport, you're not you're not gonna go anywhere. You know, you're just gonna be was, in your own way. Was that hard for? I mean, I, ever since I've known you, since you were an amateur and got, became pro, uh, you, I always, I mean, you have fantastic physique. I think you have wonderful, uh, just a lot of God-given abilities in terms of your genetic potential, but you really, really blossomed. But what was, that seemed to me like when I looked at you, I, I could be wrong, but when I looked at you, I thought, man, this, that piece must have been the easy part. The hard part is, you know, like you said, being judged and like looking at other athletes and like really put, putting yourself into the mix of this and trying to find a pathway to be better. Like you said, self-discovery. Like right. what was the toughest piece for you in that, that little realm? Well, you know, you know, when you start off and, you know, 
everything is easy. And then you realize, you know, everything is easy and I'm having this success. I really don't even know anything. Because you reach a certain level and you think, man, I'm just, I don't really know. I'm here and I made it here. And I had no clue. I have no clue how I got here. <laughs> you know, you know, it's basically, I, you know, it's just raw talent got me here. So you then you know, I go through a process of realizing, okay, I need to learn how to do this. I need to learn this about myself. And then you work with different coaches and they kind of, you know, take you here and take you there. And you got this, all this experience, all these experiences. And some of them are successful. Some of them are not so successful. But you're like, man, I'm supposed to be good at this. You know, this is something that came easy to me. But then you reach that wall like I did and you get to smack reality. It's like, nah, it's not going to be as easy as it used to be. You know, you got to find your, you know, you got to basically grind. You got to find what you're really made out of. And, you know, I reached that point where everybody's like, ah, oh, this dude is, is done. He's off. You know, really? He's, like, he's, he's wasting talent. Everybody's calling me lazy. Everybody's calling me this and calling me that, you know. And, you know, it's just basically not being able to find that groove. They don't know how easy things came to me in the beginning. So, so you had to, I, so you kind of learned some of that late. Yeah, I had to rework everything and, you know, and kind of, and just, just be stubborn about it. Like, no, I'm not going to give up because I know I can be good at this and I believe I can be good at this. So it just gave me that persistence and that, uh, that push and that drive. Just to continue to believe in myself and believe in my abilities no matter what the circumstances look like. Because, you know, this sport can be ugly. Yeah, you know, <laughs> totally. You know, it can be <laughs> ugly. You know, you know, everybody's patting you on the back. Everybody's cheering for you. You're a hero fan. one minute, <laughs> and, then, and then next thing you know, everybody's critiquing you. Everybody's telling you what you ain't doing right, what you, you know, <laughs> what you need to work on. So it's, it can be both sides. So you know, I caught both ends. You know, and one of my uh, one of my I guess my inspirations to look at that was Ronnie. When I found out about Ronnie's story, about you know, Ronnie didn't have it the easiest. Everybody counted him out. Everybody, he it's struggled right. for a long time. He was on nobody's radar. And then all of a sudden, you know, he, when he said he wanted to give up, I guess it was in 97. Uh, and uh, Vicky at the time told him, no, you ain't, you ain't giving up, you know? And next thing you know, he comes back and he wins the Mr. Olympia. Oh, so I... it's, just that, it's just that stubbornness, that grind, that could, you know, just not giving up on yourself, having the right people around you. Yeah, to you... kind of believe in you and, and just trying to, Cancel out the noise and the distractions. But, that's the toughest know. part. That that really is you. That you absolutely correct, man. That's the toughest part. Can't uh, really being able to block out, really focus, and uh, take all the distractions out. More than distractions, it's the other voices that that are trying to penetrate into who you are, trying to tell you who you are. When right. inside you, you know you, you have something else that you say, man, this is not who I am. Like, I am not that person you're saying I am. Um, right. <clears throat> and, and also, at the same time, trying to create something, too. Right. You're trying to create something new. Like, I want to be better. I want to be, you know, this, this other thing that I'm trying to create. And it's hard to do that in the midst of all that noise. Um, what, what did you use to, like, ground you? Or what did you use to, like, sit, sift through that? Well, you know, before and foremost, and I'm a, I'm a man of faith. And I wouldn't be in this sport if I didn't feel like it was destined for me to be here. You know Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of my story is bodybuilding was a complete hobby for me. I didn't take it seriously in the beginning because I, I didn't th- I didn't see any future in it, like money or anything, success. But I went to my first Olympia in, uh, let's see, what was it? By, by oh, the six. way, by the way, that's funny to say that in the same sentence. I wasn't taking this seriously. And then when I went to my first Olympia, because <laughs> so <Yeah, yeah>, yeah. <laughs> pretty much like a fitness model bro I was, model, I was in muscle and fitness and i had a manager who kind of kind of led me through the uh, amateur ranks and i didn't really know what he was doing at the time adam silver i didn't know what he was doing i didn't know he was he was kind of like laying it out for me i was just having fun and, you know being successful at these levels so we go to the uh to the olympia and i'm there with some of his models i think jamie easton is one of the ones that won i think it was one of the roles to the pros kind of advanced thing uh-huh she ended up winning, but they uh, they invited all the winners to the uh, to the Olympia, the Weeder booth. That's when they had the Weeder booth with the food. And I remember the top back in the day. So I was there, and it was like, man, I'm up here with all these people that I see in magazines. I'm having fun. I'm eating free food, drinking. I wasn't even really supposed to be up there. I just came with the right people. You know what I'm saying? So I'm thinking I'm a, I'm there, and I'm gonna see Ronnie Coleman break the record. I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm going to see 
You know, he comes out as Moses. I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be awesome. <laughs> so when they, when they call the results and they, they call him as the first runner up, man, I know the place was loud. But for me, it just was quiet. And I'm looking like this, and I'm like, wow, I'm looking at the stage, and I just feel inside of me that says, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Like, this is why you're Oh, here. wow. Because to me, that was impossible. Seeing Ronnie get beat that night was impossible. Wow. So from that moment on, I was like, okay, this is not a... The, so the, the veil was... A, was <laughs> I got to treat this like it's like a job, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's, from that moment, I think in old, I went from... Let's see, it was 07, was my first USA. Right. Nobody knew who I was. No. I had done uh, Junior Nationals the year before as a light heavyweight. I got second. But still nobody knew who I was. So in 07, that's when everybody kind of recognized who I was. I, I, I remember. I was a heavyweight, and I got second as a heavyweight. Against, I remember, uh, yeah. I was there. The guy used to play football, you know, what's the name? Uh, Griffin, Griffin. No, I'm Griffin. I don't I played remember. played for the 49ers as a fullback. He beat me. Oh, okay. Oh, um, I remember who, I can't remember the name. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Man, then, so it tip know, my tongue. Yeah, then everybody was calling me. From BSN to uh, Honey was trying to work with me. And uh, let's see, MD, Flex Wheeler was calling me. You know, I was just getting all these calls. And I was an amateur. I was like, man, how do you do my number? <laughs> I had no clue, you know? And, and that's when things kind of took off on the amateur side, you know? But so for me, it was like, that was the foundation. It was like, I feel like for me, this is like destiny. This is like I have purpose. Because at that time in my life, I had no purpose. I was in college. I had an exercise. I was pursuing an exercise science degree. You know, I was thinking I was going to be in strength coaching. And then I realized I was making more money as a trainer. And I didn't want to, <laughs> and I didn't want to go through the steps to, you know, they basically told me, you're going to open the place up. You're going to shut the place down. And you're going to make a little bit of money. So you're going to be here the longest. And you're going to make the least amount of money. You kind of got to work your way up. And I was like, man, I'm making more money in less time. So I don't think I want to be a strength coach. I don't think I want to work my way through these ranks, you know? <laughs> because, you know, with each team, and then, they, of course, when that coach leaves, it can totally change. Yeah. You can not have a job. So. Unless you become, a, unless you become the AD, <laughs> the right. athletic director. Yeah, exactly. I, I just didn't see myself in that. And that's what the reality is setting in. I didn't see myself in that field. And so I had to find something. You know, and that's what bodybuilding, kind of, I guess, came. I mean, I told people I started my bodybuilding uh, uh, journey on student loans. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I just was on the Internet, you know. It was like, you know, after that show, I was like, where else can I compete? I went to WrestleMania, and I figured I could beat that, that team champion or whatever it was. I went there and beat him. And it was just kind of, it's just, I started on student loans, but. You know, I don't have any more student loans, thank God, but uh, that's just how I went. I just took some risks. That's good. I think that's what it takes sometimes. Like, yeah, that's that faith in your in yourself. I think um, uh, faith to me is is uh, believing without proof, right? Without physical proof, and and right. uh, without some people, want, but most people don't really understand what that means to have faith in, in themselves. It's one of the questions I ask people when I, before I work with them is, do you have faith in yourself? And I don't, there, there's no right answer. I just want to know where they're at. And a lot of times, they almost always say yes, but the answer is almost always really no. They intend to have faith, but what, they only have as much faith as the circumstances support it. Once the circumstances don't support it anymore, they lose their faith. Oh, I guess I couldn't do it. Oh, I don't have good enough genetics. Or, oh, you know, like, I, this might not have enough money. Or It's like, okay, well, that's not faith, man. <laughs> so, and so I think uh, lots of great people talk about it, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and everybody else, all these people who, and anybody who's done anything really fantastic out there in the world, uh, they, you know, don't listen to anybody else. Let's block out that noise, right? Like, so was there, a, like, at that, when you're up there just watching Ronnie lose, like, that was your turning point, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's that quiet, still voice, you know. I can't say it's always just been faith in, my, in myself in general. I just felt like, you know, I feel like God is just kind of, it's like, look, this is what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's kind of how I got, that's kind of how I figured out who I was going to marry. Oh. I wouldn't marry my wife if I didn't feel like God told me I was supposed to marry my you wife. Have a, you have a really wonderful wife, I have to say. I've, no, yeah. I've known her for several years, and I'm so happy for both of you. You guys are awesome. So. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I'm, I met my wife in a dream, you know. Really? And, you Tell know, me about that. <laughs> I met my wife in a dream. I was, I was like in high school, and, you know, you know, me trying to live that player life, you know, I knew it wasn't necessarily right. I knew my mama wasn't going to be proud. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, hey, 
I you know, God, if you, if you want me to be, be straight, man, you got to show me who my wife is. You know, if you want me to stop this, you got to show me <laughs> Give me a wife. reason. <laughs> I'm having too much fun. Next thing you know, I had a dream, you know? And I'm like, wow. And I, the dream was real, so, so real, I told my mom about it. I was like, mom, look, man, I just had this dream. Uh, girl, I'm going to marry. I knew her name and everything. You really? Know? Yeah. So it was summertime. It was summertime. So my mom was like, she took it. She's like, I never told my mom nothing like that because I wasn't a mama's boy. You know, I had two younger sisters. Kind of kept to myself, but I wasn't really a mama's boy. So she she was like, what? He's telling me this? And then uh, someone went by. I just forgot. You know, I started forgetting. But as school started to come back, I started remembering again, you know? So I'm remembering. The wheels are turning. I'm thinking, I'm getting these recurrences of these dreams every night. So I'm thinking, I did have that dream. I did have that dream. So it came to the first day of school. I'm looking for this girl. I'm straight looking for her. I'm like, where's this girl at, you know? And first day of school, she didn't come. So I happened to be done with most of my classes. I'm there for second day of school. I'm working as an office worker, like an attendance office. And basically, we go get attendance folders and come back and do this and that. So it's at the end of the day, I'm in the office. Nobody ever comes in there. <laughs> I'm looking down the hallway, my buddy's playing music, and I had a personal earthquake. That's what it felt like. Oh. Like the room started shaking. Really? And I look down the hallway, and I see a group of people walking towards me. And I'm thinking, who are these people? And nobody ever comes in the office. And this family comes in the office, okay? And I'm like, okay, the family's in the office, and there's two girls, two, they're from Hawaii, two girls. There's a dad and a, and a stepmother. So I'm thinking, wow, I'm like, okay, well, who is it? Which one is it, you know? Which one is it? I'm you asking felt, you felt like there's one of these girls. Yeah, I'm like, which one is it, right? Well, not realizing this is the one I was talking, I was talking to her. I was having a conversation with him. He was talking about wrestling. He was talking about this and talking about that. But I figured it didn't dawn on me that this was the one I was talking to. Because I was like, which one is it? So I was like, I'm going to wait a week and figure out which one is it. So I knew better than to attack the new girls. I knew <laughs> you had a, you had a, you had a high school, right? <laughs> and all the guys are going to attack these new, new Hawaiian girls there. You know, I'm in Tennessee. They ain't ever seen nothing like it. <laughs> so, so I'm like, wait, I'm like, waited, a, I waited a couple of weeks or whatever. And I just stood in one spot with my buddy, uh, my buddy this day, Jonathan. And every time she walked by, which I, I guess I picked the right one, because every time this girl walked by, my wife, I'd wait. I'd just wait. she wait. She'd go about her business. So every day she got accustomed to me waiting. <laughs> and it was like, okay, she expected to see me every day. So I went to bed and it was like, the pressure was on. And it's like, man, we got to talk to her tomorrow. got to talk to her tomorrow. So <laughs> You're like, psyching yourself up for it. <laughs> No, well, you know, I just felt the pressure. It's like, I mean, I got to talk to tomorrow. It's like, it became urgent because I was just being patient. I was waiting it out, you know, letting all the, you know, people to ask her out and getting her, you know, she's so used to saying no, you know, <laughs> by routine. You, you don't want to catch that wave. That <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to be that guy. So it's one day when I said, okay, I was like, okay, I, I was prepared in my mind to ask her, to speak to her. She comes down the hall, the sun's hitting her in a special way. She's got her hair in a bun. She's kind of dressed up, and I'm thinking, it's like a movie, man. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, whoa! Now today is the day, so I'm like, I'm trying to be smooth, I'm trying to find my words. My boy standing here, he's witness. So I call her over, you know, I call her over. Now the rumor was she had a boyfriend. Oh. And she had him on her on her on her binder, and whenever anybody would ask her, you know, about dating or whatever, it would be hitting on her. She'd show him her boyfriend in the binder. So I'm, I'm prepared for this, right? So I come over, I talk to her, you know, ask her, can I get a number or whatever. She gives it to me, straight up. I didn't get no boyfriend in the binder thing. <laughs> hmm, this is good. Like, this is good. So we got to talk and we became friends. And how old were you guys again? Friends. How old were you guys? We were 17. Okay. Okay. High school. Okay. We became friends. You know, we were just good friends. I used to see her every day I walked into class. And all my friends, they didn't believe me. All my my teammates, they were like, "You're not talking to this girl." <laughs> I, I, I didn't I didn't feel I didn't feel like I had to prove it. I was like, "No, it's no big deal. Y'all gotta believe me. It don't matter, you know." <laughs> so <laughs> the the thing came. It came, and I think winter started to come. 
And apparently, you know, she was only there for her, for uh, her, her grandmother. Her dad's mother was sick and she needed to help take care. But she didn't like this wintertime thing at all because she's from Hawaii. Right. And she wasn't prepared for it. I mean, I don't like winter. So she's ready, to, she's ready to go home, you know? <laughs> and uh, so after the end of the semester, she's literally leaving. And I'm like, what? No, this can't be happening. This can't, you know, this can't be happening. This is like, it broke me. You know what I mean? I'm trying to take a prom. I'm trying to do, you know, do all this kind of stuff. It broke me. So I ended up going to prom. I ended up doing nothing. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But she was also the first person that told me that I should be a bodyguard. Really? In high school, yeah. She saw me flip, I did some flipping. She saw my six pack and she was like, you should be a bodyguard. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to be in no stage in no, in no Speedo and all <laughs> on me. You know, I was like, I was like no way, no way. So, but it was like a year later that I told her I won my first bodyguard. You know? <laughs> so, so she went home, you know, it's the time with we the airport. I saw her off and everything. Yeah. So you guys were, you guys were dating? Were you guys dating, or were you guys just? No, still? we didn't date. We were just friends. We were just friends. We were oh, just okay. friends. So we hung out like at Arpeland Hotel, which is like a nice little hotel, Gaylord Hotel, in in, in the city. In the city, it's like a biodome. So we okay. got there. It was Christmas time. You know, everything was decorated. So we had a little romantic moment. We was there with some friends and everything. And it was cool. And you know, it's like, man, I kind of bond. You know, I really bonded with it. So I'm gonna go see her off at the airport the next morning. And this is when you could go through security. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, you have a ticket. You know what I mean? Where you can so see people off. Talking, and I asked to see, I asked to see her, her, her license. And that's when we found out we had the same middle name. She was like, no way. I was like, so I showed her my license. So basically, you know, Brandy, Brandon, Brandy Lee, we had the same middle name. Okay. And for some reason, my mom remembered that that was one of the details of the dream. And that I didn't even remember. Oh, you didn't remember it. Oh, wow. And to my mom, to, I didn't even tell her about the dream. We got married and everything, and my mom comes to visit us in California, and my mom tells her. <laughs> She's like, you got <laughs> <laughs> So I never told her. I never told her anything about it. But my mom is the one that told her. Asked this after we got married. So this was like years later. Wow. Like so destiny. Like, yeah. So, I mean, she did visit like one time. She's supposed to visit 9-11. But 9-11 happened, and of course, nobody can fly. Right. <laughs> so... so so it was like seven years, bro. Seven years until I saw her again. So what was the first place I see her? Where? 2006 at the Mr. Olympia. Oh, wow. So from high school, all <laughs> it, like you just like. Pff, yeah. Wow. Huh. So it's like, it's so happy. Like I was on a plane. I had a feeling. I was like, I, think I, I was thinking I was going to see her. I don't know why. I don't know why. So I'm in the expo and I'm walking around and I'm actually looking at the girls with the painted boobs, you know? No, the yeah, the, the body paint. paint. <laughs> my manager just used to introduce me to like one of the world champion arm wrestlers. In the middle of a handshake, I hear somebody say my name. And I put my hand on his chest and I look and she's standing right there. You're like, whoa. I didn't even finish the handshake. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it kept me out of VIP. It kept me, it literally kept me out of VIP that night. When I went to, when I went to the party, <laughs> he was pissed. He wouldn't let me in. So... So I went and I, and you know, we just kind of hugged. And next thing I know, was, I was thinking I felt like I was hugging her so long. I opened my eyes and looking around, and just people just standing around looking at us. Oh wow! That's <laughs> and I was awesome. Like, oh. But it was crazy because she was there. She was there as a, as a brand ambassador for one of the supplement companies, and I was just there for management. And it was like the first time we had seen each other forever, and it just happened to be at the Olympia. Wow. <laughs> So, you know, we went from the Olympia to being at the Arnold together. We just kind of rekindled the relationship. And uh, the opportunity came for me to come out to uh, California. Well, she moved to California, first of all. She was in Hawaii. She moved out to California where around her sister, uh, just randomly. And she's like, she mentioned me prepping for the, for the USA's with her in California. So I happened to be having some problems at home. I just so happened. Just Destiny. You know, that could have been legal, legal issues. And <laughs> I got told by a particular guy who worked for, you know, for, you know, law enforcement that, you know, I should probably leave. So it was cool. So I was like, man, I got somewhere to go. So I, I took up on the opportunity and left. Same time that my 14 year old dog died. So it was like, I really had nothing. I basically gave, gave my stuff away, packed a couple boxes, and I went to California and prepared for the USA's. That was what, 2007? 2007. Yeah. 
Like, so we, had, we had nothing, bro. We had nothing. That's awesome. In California, we have a car. I had two cars at home. I went to California, I had a car, I had a walk to the gym. We walked to the grocery store, we walked everywhere. I mean, it was just like, it was just like this, <laughs> this raw, real relationship. You that's know, it started awesome. from the bottom. That's really, you that's know? actually pretty cool because, you know, you've been, you've been able to see yourselves through thick and thin, through sort of everything. And, mm-hmm. be, and that's, I think it's really important. When, the more stuff, I watched this movie called Minimalism. It's on Netflix. It's about these guys who wrote this book about minimizing all these things in our life uh, because the more things we have, that we, we tend to get focused on them. And especially in relationships, I can definitely see that there's all these distractions too. Just like in a bodybuilding career, uh, when you simplify all that stuff, then all of a sudden you're forced to focus on the person. It sounds like that's what happened to you. Even yeah, something man. simple like walking to the store. We didn't have anything. Like, like she had like she had, she had some months of money. <laughs> playing blackjack. So she had a little money saved. I just, you know, this is before I turned pro. I had a little contract money, but it wasn't the big contract money because I didn't get the big contract money until after I actually turned pro, which was like, apparently I wasn't there long before we got married. She told me I went on vacation. I had to travel with BSC for like a week. And I come back and you know, we end up getting married in Vegas. We drove down to Vegas and got married. You know, like, and that's a story in itself. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the whole story in itself, man. It was it was crazy, but uh, so it was just it was just we were young and we were naive, and I was just doing what I was thought I was supposed to do, and it, it, at the time, ignorance was just bliss. Man. That's right, man. Uh, well, well, it sounds like to me, man, it sounds an awful lot like you, that something was leading you through your life in very specific of ways. Course, of course, and that's and that's what I'm saying. That's that small still voice. I feel like you know, no matter if you got faith in yourself or not, you know, if you trust the higher power, if you believe I'm, in God. You, you figure if I'm gonna do what's right, then or what I believe is right for me, then it can't fail me, right? right. Absolutely. <laughs> That's yeah. how I feel. It's, it's like, if I, if, you know, I can like something a lot and go on this path and pursue it with all my heart, but it doesn't guarantee me anything unless I know for a fact that you know I feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. And that's kind of how that's kind of how I am in life. It's like I, I don't want to be somewhere where I'm not supposed to be. You know, and that's probably that's why I'm here, you know. Well, it felt that way with your wife, it sounds like. And yeah. it, felt, it felt that way with bodybuilding, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. That's, pretty much why, that's pretty much why I'm here. Like, my wife asked me, like, probably like a year before I came to Kuwait, would you go to Kuwait if they asked you? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> You're like, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> I said, because I didn't want to think about it. The right. opportunity hadn't presented itself to me. I didn't want to. I didn't want to ponder on things that were just out of reach because right. I didn't I didn't understand how that was going to happen. Right. But, smart uh, though. It's smart. It's smart not to yeah. worry about stuff that you don't have to worry about. Exactly. <laughs> but it just happened after 2000 what 2016 placing last at Olympia. I talked to my coach Abdullah after prejudging. He had just worked with Victor Martinez. Kind of revived him. You know, revived him. Uh-huh. And uh, and I said, man, you did a great job with Vic, bro. He said, man, I you know I really I really like your work because I was impressed. And he looks at me, he says, you know, you want to come to Kuwait? And I was like, he says, I think I can make you top six in the world. And I was like, I'll tell you what. I said, I'm going to be in Kuwait in two weeks because I, I came for the Kuwait Pro. And I said, I'll, I'll check it out. I'll give it a fill and I'll, I'll let you know. So I come here. He, he knows everything about me already. He like, knows my best looks. Knows he, you know, he studied me. And he, and he told me how long they've been around the sport and been watching. But these guys have been around just, just watching everything for a while. So they know, they love bodybuilding. And, you know, he just was so into everything. And he already had a plan laid out. So, wow. So, so it was like, I get home my wife's, yeah, my wife, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And I get home and my wife's like, so you call him yet? You call him, tell him you come. Call him, tell him you come. And she's bugging me about it. I mean, I'm patient. I'm just like, I said, I already told him I'll be here around this time. No reason to bug him about it. So she, she was on me. She was on me. She, so she had faith in them as well, yeah. right? Yeah, she, she, knew something was, she knew something was going on. Going on. And, and it definitely it was definitely what I needed because the chemistry I had with my coach, Abdullah, is crazy. It's crazy. It's, good, it's just crazy. And I've worked with a lot of good coaches. I can't say I've worked with bad coaches. Right. I've been in past one of the best coaches. But, you know, just the chemistry I have with him, his enthusiasm, <clears> his faith. 
and uh, and what we can do as a team is also pretty, pretty big too. So. I think that. So what I sense, <clears throat> you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, one of the things that makes a really truly great coach is uh, something that you're describing about Abdullah. And I don't know Abdullah. I know him just through social media. Um, I think I, we've we've mentioned we've talked to each other briefly <laughs> through messages, but uh, he seems like a really wonderful guy. Um, I think that what makes a really great coach for what for a particular athlete is that they believe in you. They have this. They have a vision. That they believe, and there's, but there's a many coaches, really great coaches out there, and we don't have. There's a lot of them out there, um, especially a lot of the big ones that they have faith in themselves, and they have, they could, they, they feel like they have that they can do. They that you're they're doing you a service almost, <laughs> in some ways, and and that's that's okay too for some guys. This works well for, but I think um, that a coach needs to be a good leader in some ways. In some, they have to have the vision for you as well. You can't be the only one who believes. You know what I mean? You can't be the, like, let's see. You're like, so that's wonderful. I think that's like, man, that's all. Cause I'm a big, I'm big on mindset. I talk about it. I preach about it. I write about it. I do videos about it. And I think, <clears throat> um, and I even actually emailed, um, last year, I think it was, um, uh, Bader and mentioned that, Hey man, you should consider having a mindset coach for your athletes. Because if you get the mind right, the body will follow. I believe in this, right? And then you're talking about like belief and you know faith in yourself and all these things, and that doesn't come naturally in our in our culture in our society because it wants to tell you, and especially like you said, the sport is like hell on people's egos, right? Like right, right. Pro, pro bodybuilders are the worst, right? Like you, they get one criticism, it's like oh my god, they fall apart sometimes. <laughs> right, right, right. right. <laughs> Some of the guys like will just stay off social media the last couple of weeks before a show. You know, because they right. don't they don't want that affecting their mind, and that's smart. Yeah, just don't stress, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I find it I find it funny, man. I find it funny because you know it's just a funny process to me. It's a funny process when people show up in my inbox and they give me advice oh, based really? on nothing. <laughs> I like it. I just like it. You know, I, I put a like on them. Like they wasted their time to come tell me this, or critique me, or to judge me in this way. It's it's fine. Right. It amuses me. It, it, it's, it's interesting. It's Mo human. I, I, I imagine crazy. most of it's done with good intention, right? They want you to do well. They're like, hey, man, you should do this, or hey, you should try this, or whatever it is that they're offering. Right, right. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I just find, it's, I find that our humanness is very, it's very, very interesting to me. It, it, you know, it can be frustrating at times <laughs> dealing with human beings, but <laughs> when you break it down and you, and you simplify it and you analyze, it's like, man, you know. We can be a mess sometimes. You know? Oh, we, yeah. We're real trip, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like those, those you know, when I see that, man, and, 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 I, and I think about it, I'm like, what, what? Even when it's, like, negative and it's not in good intention, I'm thinking, what motivates you? What motivated you today? <laughs> you got up today. <laughs> yeah, and, just, and just do this. <laughs> or in my inbox. I don't really understand. But they spent all kinds of time and mental energy <laughs> to put something down. I know. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the same thing sometimes. I'm like, wow, man. Like, you don't. You really don't know this person, but you're going to spend all this time and mental energy and like focused on that. Like, it has, what, what it brings me to, to know is that it's not really about you. It's about them. Like, you know, like... It's, What's... <laughs> One of my favorite things to see is when somebody comes on my page, and they're and they're fans of another athlete, and they're tagging another athlete on my page, or, or hyping another athlete. And I'm thinking, this is interesting. Why are you on my page? I'm like, oh well. I don't know what to think about. I guess I should be flattered that you. You know, they're trying to gain. They're, they're probably trying to grab a hold of some of that momentum that you have. Which right now, I really have to say, and I and I saw this last year, and and I've had uh, and I've been very vocal about it that you know you created some really, some really wonderful momentum in your, and it has solely to do with. I don't. I never thought of you as a lazy uh, bodybuilder or anything like that before. I always thought you had wonderful potential. I but I did. There was but obviously there was some missing ingredient for you. Uh, uh, that and I think some of it was focused, and some, but some of it was probably because I don't. I never saw you, like I said, as a lazy athlete, as a lazy person. I just sometimes we just need <clears throat> to get some of this momentum, and sometimes it's helpful to have somebody who has the same vision, like Abdullah, yeah, like yeah, to have the same yeah. vision and help you bring it together. Because we, none of us do that. I don't care what anybody says. I've heard. I uh, last year after the Chicago Pro, uh, what's his name? Uh, who won? Um, gosh. Um, Wonderful um, bodybuilder. I, mean, I don't know why I'm blanking on his um, name. The Puerto, is the Puerto Rican guy? No, black guy. Um, massive. Uh, uh, gosh. Ah, oh, man. Uh, Michael Lockett. So Michael Lockett. Michael Lockett. Yeah, so, yeah, and yeah. I like him. Um, he seems like a nice guy. I don't really know him really well, but he came, he went on social media, he said something about, 
uh, he, he really made, did, was like a rant about how he did everything on his own. He was uh, did, and he went, and he was sort of proud of that. And I and I get that. That's fine. But my 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 knowing in this world is that none of us do any of this stuff alone. Like we don't do it alone, man. Whether not even, and whether it be a higher power or whether, but we have a host of like people that whether who indirectly and directly support us and help us and move us along this path. And they dealing with our, they dealing with all our crap, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really important to recognize that as a as an athlete, as a person, as an individual in this life, because when you recognize it and you and you uh, have that awareness, then it be- makes you more powerful. You know, you 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 gain more from this. Like you know, like I feel good. Like people always ask me, like, why do you why are you the way you are, Tad? Like I can, because it may I'm the beneficiary. Like I love everybody, but I also am the beneficiary here. Okay, I I feel it too. But when I go out there and like. Like, that's why you never hear me rant and stuff, because, like, that makes me feel bad. Like, I don't want to talk about shit I don't like, man. Like, that's... Good, man. Are you rich? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I can see people winding up, you know, on social media. Like, they're winding up. Like, ah, fuck, I might have trumped this and this and this. I'm like, man, I'm like, I'm like I just don't want to see the playback, you know? I don't want to play PC played over and over again. If I rant, I don't want nobody recording. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to see. I don't want to watch it over and over again. Me ranting. You know? <laughs> what? Uh, um, so that year, um, <clears throat> that I really like that story. I. It sounds like like really, man. Well, that's a pretty powerful story about you meeting your wife because uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was. You know, I've always been. I, I believe that there are certain things in this life that are destined. Like we just that we have this certain that we come here for, in this experience for very particular reasons. Sometimes, whether it be. Um, you know, a higher power or whatever the purpose is or whatever the reasons are. It doesn't matter if you acknowledge it or not. Sometimes we're here for a purpose. And I believe in that. I truly believe in that. Um, and so, like, I think, and part of us, it's what, it's those individuals, I believe, that acknowledge that purpose and, and, full, and lean into it that really start to realize their own greatness in this world. And I, and I felt that, man, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to brag on you a little bit. I felt that way about you in, the, in bodybuilding. And I've gone on record and said, yeah, man, I really, really believe that Brandon Curry is one of the next guys who's, who could be, who really can be the next Mr. Olympia, the next new Mr. Olympia. I really believe that. Um, I, I, and, it's be, and it's because there, it's, I felt genetically, there's, it's, it's a, there's so many guys who have really great job. Like Flex Wheeler, probably one of the greatest genetically gifted athletes, but never got the Olympia. Why? Right. And he's the first, I talked to him in Kuwait like, like a year and a half ago, and he was honest, like, yeah, it was because I wasn't right up here. Like, I thought the world owed me everything, and I wasn't, I, you know, like, and I totally didn't, uh, you know, utilize my talent, and it was all up here. And I think, man, just get, when you tweak that right, you know, then all of a sudden you turn, like, you take a guy like Branch Warren, who's really got, and I love Branch now, <laughs> But, but but he's not really the greatest genetically gifted guy, right? For bodybuilding, but he turned a mediocre genetically uh, genetic physique into a won the Arnold twice, second at the Olympia, a really a world class physique, one of the best in the world, all through sheer effort, right, and belief. And that's like man, like that's the whole deal here. Like we're creators. Like this is awesome here in this experience. And sometimes there's these these components of this life that just make it such a wonderful way to experience this life. But when we fight against it. Man, we just we, we're we're adding our own resistance to it. Well, I try I try to I try to look when I step back and I look at my situation, and I say, you know, it couldn't happen any any other way, because I, I needed to be humble. I needed to be humble. I needed to be, you know, brought down in this position the way I could say, okay, you know, yeah, it's not just me. Because <laughs> I, I come in, I come in with so much success, so much hype, so much things going on. I it takes more than that in order to be able to look look at things properly. At this, from this perspective now, you know, could be in a position where I'm coming back up and everything's happening. You know, I needed to be able to say, you know, appreciate the people around me, appreciate the people that, that's allowed me to get better, appreciate the people that are patient with me. Uh, because, you know, and, and it gives me a, di- a better perspective, you know, uh, on the whole outlook. So I'm not, I'm, I, it allows me not to have too much of a big head in this, you know, because I know it could have it all went terrible. <laughs> So, it's easy for it to go know, sideways me, on us. You know, for me, I'm, I, I appreciate it all because I mean, uh, my coach he vouched for me to be here. And oh. He vouched personally. He personally vouched for me to be here, and he'll be the first one to tell you he personally vouched. And he said some things people don't, don't necessarily agree with, but oh. you know, he's he's a visionary, and he's gonna he, and he's tenacious. He's gonna give it to you like he sees it. He don't care if you agree with him or not. That's good. So That's good. Like, <clears throat> I like that. Know, so 
people like that that are around you to kind of reinforce you. I mean, support you, and you know, they give you that energy uh, mm -hmm. to keep going. And it's like he's battling with me, you know. He's mm -hmm. battling with me, just like my wife. She's battling with me. She's willing to let me come out here, you know, chase this crazy, crazy dream to be the best bodybuilder I can be. You know, she's as she's holding things down with the family, making sure every everything in their, my kids' life is normal as can be. You know. <laughs> So yeah, I got all these people battling for me, you know, and it's like, man, I just can't, I just can't see myself, <laughs> you know, just letting these people down either, you know. It's, it's one thing to let yourself down. Right. But, you know, the support team, you know, I got these people on my back that they, they're looking for me. I, I really don't think, no matter what the end results are in your career uh, from this point forward, that with the kind of attitude that you have and the kind of uh, foundation that you have uh, spiritually and personally, I just don't think you could let any of these people down. You certainly couldn't let me down, no matter what, how you place. And mainly because I know the kind of person you are, and uh, and and I really like that. I think that success for me is more than just a title or an award. Although that's great, and we don't want to ignore that. <laughs> I was like, but we also don't want to ignore that there are so many other powerful elements in our lives that really inspire. Like it's more inspirational for me. To see a, to see a champion who who more than just wins, but wins with a certain degree of dignity and wins with a certain degree of class and a certain degree of intelligence and a certain degree of respect and 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 goodness and and you know well being some really good something that is truly worthy of emulation, you know that was one of the things I I consider those attributes to be noble character attributes and since I was a kid. If you were to ask me what I strove to want to be, it was I wanted to be someone who was worthy of emulation, somebody who's noble, has noble character, and, and whatever that means, you know. And I have spent my life trying to figure out what some of that means. <laughs> it's like, and to me, it's a lot of that has to do with honesty, a lot of it has to do with sincerity, but but also has to do with truly enjoying the fabric of my life, but but helping others to enjoy theirs as well through love and through uh, and through joy. It's just really simple, and I try to do my best at that, and I find. To the champ, people who inspire other people, man, you have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful opportunity to really do some of this, right? As as a leader in an industry, in a sporting industry, or whatever it is, even people who are in a church or people who are in a in a, a company doesn't matter, or even a family, right? Like fathers and mothers have a unique responsibility that most don't recognize. I recognize my responsibility as a father because my daughter looks at me and I'm like Superman. She thinks, she looks at me and she says, she said, I remember like a year and a half ago, she said, Daddy, are you as famous as The Rock? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but she but sees me, is. she sees me that way, right? Like, right, right. <laughs> it's wonderful, right? It is it's awesome. Wonderful. It is awesome, right? And so. That's, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. When, when my wife sends me video of all the kids, you know, they're at their friend's slumber party or whatever, and they're watching, they're watching videos of the Olympia, and, you know. Oh, like, that's my dad, that's buddies. my dad. He's. He's got a screen. He's got a screensaver on his phone. It's my son's friend, you know. <laughs> my son's hyped me up so much, you know. <laughs> this kid, he's got me on his phone. It's like, stuff like that is is crazy. And then hearing, you know, all the people appreciate you guys in my inbox, just being honest with me, telling me, you know, maybe you've been through hard times and seeing me, you know, do come through, come out on the other side of the hard times has inspired you. You know, that really, really. I really love hearing those stories. I love hearing that those things that you know I don't, I'm not necessarily aware of. And then you take the, the time and the intimate moment to share these things with me. It, I really, really appreciate it because it just lets me know, man, that you know ain't nobody. There's nobody alone in this, and and you inspire people all the time. And even if you're having a bad day, seeing something <laughs> like that, it's like wow, you know, it's like it just changes everything. So, well, something I, think... I appreciate you guys. Man. I appreciate. You. <laughs> I think sometimes it can, uh, even for people like who are in the limelight, who are on a pedestal, so to speak, you can, it can feel lonely. It can feel a little bit, a lot, like you can feel like you're alone. I know um, a lot of times, uh, it's, even if, no matter how much attention you get uh, from, you know, winning or whatever it is, um, it can sometimes feel a little bit alone. Uh, and so I, so that I can see how, and I, I, I definitely love it when I get, uh, fan, and I've, I, actually it's kind of weird because I get it from a different perspective. Um, even though I, I was a fairly successful bodybuilder, I consider myself a successful bodybuilder. I did win a national title, but I, but I never competed as a pro, and which I'm happy because I took my career in a slightly different direction. But I'm, but when people well, they'll, they'll contact me and they'll say, "Yeah, man, I'm really like you inspire me. I love what you have, what you're what you're about, and I've been following you since I was a kid." I'm like. Wow. I'm like, since a kid, I'm like, am I that fucking, am I that fucking old? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, 
So that's what, but uh, other than that, but it does make me feel good. Like, you know, that you, we all, and I tell people this, look, even if you're in the limelight or not, you inspire somebody, most likely. Somebody's watching. Some, Somebody's always watching. You know, they're watching you. They're watching how you handle every situation, you know. And, you know, you know if you can be an example of perseverance, and, you know, and, you know just, just being tough, mentally tough, and, and you know, just, just being grounded and not giving up, you know. You can, if you can be that for somebody else, you know, it's just amazing. I, I mean, I want to be there for my kids, you know. But, you know, to be there for another adult, another peer, another bodybuilder, you know, in the industry, whoever it may be, you know, it's, 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 it's cool. It's just cool. It's just something that you don't really think about in the beginning. But in hindsight, when it comes, mm-hmm. starts to come and people start to share those experiences with you, it's like, man, it's just wild. It's like, man, it's not, nothing's in vain, you know? Nothing's Abs- in Absolutely, man. That's, per- that's perfectly said. No- nothing, nothing that we do, no matter what challenges we face, it all has such wonderful purpose if we allow it to, if we allow it to. And um, the kind of funny because um, I, I, you know, I think we get so focused on wanting to pursue goals and wanting to achieve things that we miss out on that day-to-day interaction. We miss out on the value that that can have for us. Sounds like you're really sort of soaking that up, and I'm so glad to hear that because that's, I, I really believe that's part of the magic of success. Uh, of, of certain people's su- true success, that they are able to find the joy in all their experiences. There may be stuff in there like you miss your wife and you miss your kids, but there's also other stuff too. Like it's not going to be that way forever, right? Like, you know, they, <laughs> um, what was this most surprising thing? Or like, I should say, what was the most, the funniest or surprising sort of um, uh, thing that you've experienced from a fan or from, from anybody in the industry, like a story, just, uh, just out of curiosity, that you never expected? Man, you know, the first time that I've had an awkward fan reaction, you know, you get people to faint and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm the red, right? But when I was in L.A., uh, I experienced something I've never experienced before. I was a young bodybuilder, too, I guess, but I was out there a lot. And uh, a guy standing in front of me, and I'm standing at a table, and I'm standing up, and it was Trey. Remember Trey Brewer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. standing me, right? He's a big and dude. This one guy, he has a camera in his hand. He says, could you please let me take a picture of your bicep. And I said, okay. okay. <laughs> so I, you know, I throw up my arm and let him take a shot. And before he takes the picture, he just disappears. Like, and I hear, <laughs> <laughs> and he disappears. And Trey looks up over the table. I look over the table and I'm thinking, where did this guy go? He literally just collapsed in front of me. And I'm thinking, that's gotta be the weirdest thing. He fainted? Ever happened. What, did he like faint that's or something? The weirdest thing. That's ever happened to me. That same weekend, though, it was the whole, L.A. was the whole weird weekend. There was a guy that was watching me from about 15 feet away. You know how the expos have intersection cross right, intersection? Right. You know? He was just standing there. I'm like, why is this guy watching me, Trey? He's just weird. Like, what's going on with this dude? <laughs> and he just didn't come up and say anything. He just was just there and watched. And it was just so creepy, bro. So I leave and I go to lunch. And man, sure enough, this guy ran into him. I'm like, he didn't even say. He didn't even say anything. He He's just staring at me. He reached his hand out and he shakes my hand. Okay, and and I'm like, okay, but I realized there's something in my hand. Huh? And he handed me like a substantial amount of cash, and I'm thinking, and he walks away. Huh? <laughs> and I that was just strange. And I'm like, who's this guy? He just handed me some money. The like, weird guy handed me money. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. So you never saw him again? The LA Fit Expo. That was just strange. So you, you never saw that guy again? He just disappeared? I never saw the guy again. Never. <laughs> he just had to just, I want that yeah. to happen to me, man. <laughs> yeah, two crazy incidences at Bodybuilding Expo. Wow. Just, like, wow. Same day. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you got to realize, like, when you, when, you, uh, when you turn pro, did you expect to, like, be able to go to Olympia and, and be really one of the contenders or be really one of the, uh, the you know, these top-watched guys? Well, you, you, my cocky little mind at the time, yeah. And then, so what was that, what ha- so during that process, it sounded like before you said, like, oh, it kind of, you kind of got brought down to earth a little bit. Yeah, So yeah, yeah, exactly. what was? I got, I, you know, because I'm on this train and everybody's like, hey, you're, you're great, you're great, you're good, <laughs> you're going to be this, you're going to be that. And, you know, at the time, you know, I guess as a young guy, especially that young, you know, not experienced a lot of life, you know, that, that can get to you. Right. That can, that, that can mess, that can mess you up and you 
you take that too much, you know, you'd be good for nobody. And nobody can be around you. You know, everybody wants to be your friend because you're the popular guy. But right. Really, nobody can stand you. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of blessed enough to go to the point to where that just came to an end before it could get out of control, you know? Because I could only imagine if that, that kept going. I, such reality just kept building and building, and everything that I, that I stepped foot in was just every door I stepped in would open for me. That, that probably would have been a big problem. And I went through that whole phase until now. I had a friend uh, in college, a really close friend of mine in college. He was ranked number 12th in the country as a defensive back. His name was Brian Beck. He's still one of my good friends. Um, and I remember we were in school. We were in college together, and he uh, got he got drafted. He was on Oregon State. I got my Oregon State shirt on. He was, uh, he was playing for Oregon State, and uh, we would train together. And I would help him with his routines and stuff. And um, he, I remember he got drafted by the Redskins, and it was the same year. By the way, that was the year that they went to the Super Bowl. They drafted him that year, and they were it was a nice big contract. But then he broke up with his girlfriend, and he his girlfriend she was pissed off about this, and he started dating this other girl that I we both knew. She was a really nice lady, and um, she was his ex girl was upset, and so she went to the police and said that he that, she, that he raped her, and of course being in kind of homogeneously white Corvallis, um, they kind of like, they arrested him and like, and, and then he they went to court. And of course, all of his friends and everybody vouched for him and said, nah, man, this is ex government. And of course, they threw it out of court, but the Redskins dropped him from their, they dropped the contract and it was like a $4 million contract. I'm like, man, I'm like, bro, are you upset? And he's like, no. He's like, because, he goes, this is the best thing to have. He was very, he was very spiritual. And he's like, he was, and he's like, Ted, he said, if I was, if I had gone into the, the NFL, he said, man, I would be partying every day. I'd be have I, girls would be throwing themselves at me. But they already were. Like, we would hang out with these. Oh, they were already doing that shit. And I was like, he's like, man, he's like, it would, it would be bad news. He says, this was God's way of showing me, of, of moving me in the direction that I needed to be. And he ended up getting his master's in education and going off and heading up, being principals at these Edison school projects in the inner cities. They would take over you know, these underperforming schools. And then he would, he would, and he was really good at it. He would just, he would lock the doors, you know, like the stuff you see in the movies, like lock the doors, keep the gang members out. Like he's like, I keep these rules and he would turn these schools around. So he had the success story. But I remember thinking, man, cause I like football. I'm like, oh man, man you could have been playing. I couldn't, and you could have caught me on the 50 yard line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it takes a certain amount of, of uh, honesty to, to, to look at it like that. You know what I mean? Because, you know, you oh, he could have been really upset. He could have been like really jaded, and right. so like you know, like any like anybody like who experiences a high degree of success like you and stuff, and then it kind of feels like you get the rug gets pulled off underneath you. You can kind of feel jaded about it, and it could turn you around the opposite direction. Right. And so right. it's so just like we talked about earlier. I really believe it's attitude and mindset that keeps you moving in the right direction. That you can take that negative situation, you can take that potentially negative situation and not use it to your best advantage, not use it as an experience of learning. Like, I think we should always ask ourselves two questions whenever we experience anything. What did I do to attract it? And what am I supposed to learn from this? If you can ask those questions, it keeps you in perspective and allows you to say, okay, like this is really actually good for me. It's helping me learn, right? Like in your case, hey man, yeah, I mean, I can't just like rest on my laurels. I can't, I'm not, they're just not going to hand this stuff to me just at another. I got to do, I got to actually invest in myself and really develop myself. Um, what, what, what did you, what, what was the first step for you for, for like developing yourself, like really moving you? Because you seem really today a lot more, very comfortable with yourself now. You seem very, a lot, you seem pr pretty happy and you seem very adjusted and also, and, and, a, and a really wonderfully balanced, uh, uh, you know, champion. Like I really consider that, like that's really tough. Because I talk to a lot of guys, I know them, and they're wonderful guys, but some, and, and gals, but some of them, they're still battling their own egos, their own insecurities, and they're using this as a platform to really justify or, or validate themselves. And I'm like, oh man, you're already great. Like this is just the icing on the cake, you know. Like you don't. You know? <laughs> so how, what was it for you? Like, well, you know, uh, first, first of all, you know, I, I, mean, I just I was with the right, right woman. You know? Okay. She challenged me. You know, she basically challenged. She challenged my ego to the greatest extent. Like you know, because she knew. She knew, man. I had, I had, a, I had a big, a big ego, ego. Like she knew, she, she exposed it. Anything that I know about myself, <laughs> she's like, she, she told me, she told me about myself. And you know, it was just because of my own life experience that I just didn't see this stuff about myself. So I had to just start listening to her. And even though I may not always admittedly agree, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, when these situations would come up, you know, I'd be like, yeah, you know, she's right. <laughs> 
I, knows me. She knows me from a different perspective, you know. <laughs> you know, so you know, basically just having that, you know, somebody that can be real with you, uh, and, 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 and give you the reality. Not because not because they're trying to tell you down, but right, because right. they love you. you know? Yeah, they, they want you. Want they want to build you up. They want you to realize right. your potential, and you can't realize your potential when you're self deluding yourself, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, you can't do it. So you know, me, of course, you know, be you know, being a man, you know, it's just it's not the easiest thing to do. No. And you know, I can under, I can understand, you know, I can understand that. I've seen it. I've always been stubborn in a bad way and in a good way. <laughs> so so I have to realize when I'm being stubborn in a bad way and, and be able to humble myself and, and you know, let that go. And then I have to realize the situations where my stubbornness actually benefits me. You know, so it's 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 just kinda you know, it's it's kinda being able to just look at it from the right perspective because it's not all bad. No. But you can't think it's all good either, you know. You know, you can't you can't think this this is gonna always work in your favor. So it just took me being honest with myself and, and, and being able to trust, you know, trust my wife and trust, you know, other people to care to, around me, you know. Because no matter what, you know, she's gonna be real with me. Well <laughs> She's gonna be straight up real with me. That's good. I think we all need we all need that that sort of uh, grounder person who can ground us. Uh, and I think people's um, in the past I probably haven't been so good with having a, a mate that grounded me. <laughs> well, I have a strong. It. You can resist it. Yeah. Resist it. I'm, I'm 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 smarter. I'm I, I can say I'm smart enough to know to use the English language to, to just manipulate myself out of, out of sticky situations if I want to. I've done it with girls plenty of times. <laughs> but, you know, when you, when you got a woman that's gonna say, no, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and, you know, and, it's, and I'm not gonna sit here and just act like it's gonna work. Like <laughs> you know, then you have to say, okay, you know, you have to realize, okay, I'm caught, you know, and I, you know, do I really wanna battle this hard? For me to prove this point, or for me to have this position that I have. Is really it that to, important? <laughs> is it worth it to me? Right. Or is it? It's easier to just recognize. Okay, she's not doing this because she's she, she don't like you. She she may not like this part about you. She's not doing this for any ill intentions. She's trying to help you out, bro. <laughs> you know? She's just trying to help you out. <laughs> that's you know? a, she's that, just trying to help you be a better person. That's maturity, once man. Once you have kids, and once you have kids, here's the thing. Here's the kicker. Once you have kids, and you know, I have three boys. You start to see yourself. Oh yeah. <laughs> different parts of yourself in these boys, and you're thinking to yourself, Whoa, "Damn, <laughs> that is me. That's a part of me." And this, is, and you, you find yourself trying to direct these these young males in a, in a better perspective and trying to help them overcome some of these natural tendencies. That, you know, <laughs> could be their downfall if if they don't learn. You know, to look, look at themselves in a proper perspective. You know, or if you let them get carried away with these. You know, this certain egos with a certain you know you start to see that you start to analyze yourself but yeah you know, but you're there, you know? well you know for, so. for me being a father inspired me to be to really take that seriously to, to develop myself internally i mean i was always on that path but i really took it more seriously really put me in check especially when it came to women because i always i, I was raised by a single mother but so i have a deep respect for women um as as equals but my having a daughter now all of a sudden I viewed the women in my life who I was intimate with with very differently, you know, because yeah. now she's going to be, someone's going to be looking at her that way someday. And yeah. I want her to be able to recognize the bozos from the, ones, <laughs> from the ones who really do care about her and love her and have her best interest at heart. And so she, because I know she'll have theirs, of course, because right? that's the way I, I'm raising her. So, but what is it? So being a father, like that was, sounds like that was uh, a, a growth experience as well in terms of how you reflected on yourself in, and how did that move into your body blame? Did it, did it affect your body blame? Oh, yeah. I mean, because I mean, they're watching you, you know. They're watching you. And, and you know, and you thinking, oh, man, if I'm slacking here, if I'm, if I'm doing that, I'm seeing that in them, you know, it kind of reflects, it can reflect upon maybe what, what they're picking up on me. So, you know, it's like, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't be honest with myself and say, maybe they won't notice. They won't notice. But, you know, they can't help it. They, they emulate what they see. Mm -hmm. they, emulate, they can't help. They just can't help it. And when you're trying to correct something uh, between them, then it's almost like, okay, they're not going to get this if they don't have an example. They're just not going to hear my words. 
this is my words are just going to go you know, <laughs> right over there. Yeah, they, these kids, they're going to have to see it. They're going to they gonna have, to understand, they gonna have to understand it from a perspective, a visual perspective. That's me, the visual, you know? Right. They right. Gonna, cause their mama can talk to them all day. You know? <laughs> we, know how to, we know how to tune women out. You know, we can tune women out if you want. And, you know, so they're going to have to see it. You know, they're not going to, you know, even at a young age, it's just like, I've always been logical. You know, you gotta have to explain something to me. You gotta have to take the time to help me work this out. So I find myself doing the same thing. I'm like, look, this is not about your emotions. This is not about your feelings. You know, this is about what you need to understand as a man. You know, you don't know what you're feeling right there now. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you upset, it does not matter. Understand what I'm trying to talk to you. Calm down. Understand what I'm trying to tell you, because these feelings, they're temporary. They're, this not gonna matter. You know, I need you to be responsible in this way because this is, you know, you're the, you know, you got to respect him in this way. You know, it's just, it's just all the little things that you say, man. You know, if I don't take care of these things now and get them to learn these things now, they can end up, they can end up, you know, <laughs> like the, in a position that I saw myself possibly going in. It's not necessarily right. Or if they can learn these things earlier than I did. It, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it would you know, could prevent them from doing this and this and this wrong, you know? So it's like, in, 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 as far as bodybuilding, it's like, man, you know, I, I'm going to have to, this is my job, so my kids don't know any normal life. You know, they, if their dad's home, he's always home, you know? Right. You know, if their dad's away, then he's away, you know? He's not, he's not the guy that comes home every day at a certain time of hour. They never see that, so they don't understand like real normal life. How, how do they view so, that? How do they take? How do they take that? Do they know like okay, like how how old are your three boys, for instance? Let's see, we got five, we got let's see nine, and we got uh, six, six, and seven, and, and, and your girl is, and she's fourteen. So so yeah. so how do they all view this? I'm sure they all view it differently. Like dad's home for these months, he's away these months. They, 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 they don't have any other way to view it. They, they never seen anything different. I mean, they never seen anything different. I mean, when, when my daughter was young, she, she spent so much time with us. You know, it's ridiculous. She never was, she, she went everywhere with us. She went to the gym with us. She went everywhere with us. So, you know, all she knew was training, working hard, uh, dieting, eating, doing this. You know, she, all she knew was that. So in her life now, she's into soccer. And you know, and she's got that mentality. She's she works hard. She wants to be better. She's you know she understands that you know she's got to, she loves to train. You know she understands it's gonna make her better. You know she's picked up on these things just because you know she knows if she's gonna be successful with something, this is the model that you gotta follow. <laughs> you know that's and good. It's, it's what's cool. But then we gotta instill stuff like the stuff that she doesn't see, like the grades. The you know you know. It doesn't come without this, you know. You gotta. This is important too. All the physical aspects and everything is great, but you have to put the time in with the schooling, and you gotta make sure that you know. And then the boys. Oh, uh, <laughs> luck, luckily for me, you, 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 you know, mom is the emotional one. She's gonna come with you know how she's feeling, and then I can come behind her as the, the good cop. <laughs> Communicate, you know what I mean? I communicate, so you know you don't want to hear mom, you know, but you'll listen to me because I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you in a way to where I'm not upset. I'm gonna explain it to you the best I want to have. I'm gonna give you some game. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you some game, you know. And then when you 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 may not understand this game, but then you begin to see it. It's you know your friends tell you, oh this is happening, this is happening, and you go, oh my dad knows what he's talking about. Well, your mom does too. But she she just come from a different perspective. Yeah, she just come from a different perspective. She she's seeing her girl, you know, being taken advantage of. It makes her emotional. But I know you're not gonna you're not gonna listen to that <laughs> in that emotional state. Because when my mom was emotional with me, I don't want to hear it. But if you explain something to me, you're trying to help me to learn, then it's kind of different. So it's it's, it's it's these things with the kids, man. It's like I enjoy being a dad, man. It's, it's 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 one of the best things ever, to be honest. I, and uh, and and problem solving with these kids is is, is awesome. I mean, I mean, as much as it is frustrating, <laughs> sometimes you sit back and you just laugh because you think, 
You know, these kids, sometimes they're in a position where they think they know everything already. You know? <laughs> like, man, I used to be that. I used to think I know everything. And then, you know, like, trust me, in a couple of years, you know? you're not going to care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, you think so many things are so important to them. And it's like, you're trying to get these points across. And, you know, hopefully they're picking up on, you know, examples and they're taking all this in. You don't really know until you, you, you get these situations outside <laughs> of yourself or, you know, your wife's telling you this happened or that happened. You're like, man, they, they really listen to me. Really- <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you start to see your fruits of your labor, you know, they're paying <laughs> off. So it's one of those investments that you make that, you know, it can, it can really, really pay off. You know, and it, it can just, you know, if you're into it, you take it seriously, you know, so. I love being a dad. I take it. I take it seriously, man. Because this I, world, it's this world is not getting any easier to live. In, no, know? man. It gets. It seems like it gets harder. It gets better, but it gets. But there are aspects that absolutely get harder, especially with like social media and with like technology. How, as wonderful as it is, there are disadvantages. I actually read this um, research uh, that they said that girls, the age of your daughter, that age group, growing up into the world of social media, and specifically girls, it doesn't seem to affect boys as much uh, but it affects girls in a way that makes them they like they there's more cutters there's more depression and, and anxiety and they and they because they're con- they feel constantly judged and they they I mean they see these other women on social media their friends and then the girls man when they when they get bullied by other girls in school on social media they are friggin' relentless man these girls are mean man <laughs> I'm like got boys but I remember being in school man you have a you have a beef with somebody you duke it out and then your friends the next day like, you know, exactly. It's like, you get it over with, hey man, we're done, are we good with this? <laughs> and then you're done. But girls, man. We went, through, we went through the phase with the daughter, and we went to the point, we got to the point to where we was like, you know, you're different, you're different. And people people like you because you're different. They want you to be you. You know, they reach a certain age where they, they all want to be the same. Yeah, I know. Try to find the themselves. This, they, all want to, they all want to look alike, and I'm thinking, no, no, you don't look like anybody else. You know, quit <laughs> you trying are. to straighten your hair, it's just a waste of time, you know. <laughs> Not gonna happen, you know. Oh, you know, she don't want to straighten like, her hair, does she? Like your people, your friends like you for you. And you if know? they don't, you don't want them. If they don't, you don't want them. So it <laughs> took her. It took us. You know, we we actually pulled her. She got so involved in soccer when she's traveling. We pulled her out of, out of actual regular school. Well, first she went to a soccer school. Okay. Where they only did soccer, and then we pulled her out because she went to another league. So she travels quite a bit. So she's actually homeschooled. Oh. And just to see her get comfortable with herself. So, th- so the homeschooling helped her get more comfortable. Oh man, just just to see her get comfortable with herself, and not think she had to keep up with this trend or that trend, and just become her own unique person. It's been awesome. It's been That's cool. It's been That's awesome. Good. Everybody tells you, oh, they don't get socialization and this and this. You don't need it. <laughs> you don't need that kind of socialization. <laughs> she has teens. She spent time with teens, and right. she even communicates with her old friends that she went to school with. And sure. she's always helping them with their with their issues and their problems. <laughs> it's because she's got she's grounded. It sounds like she's more grounded. She's that kind of that kind of friend. She's a good friend. And so, but it, I remember I remember when she's going through that phase. I'm like, so you're not like anybody else. Don't don't try to be like everybody. You're you. Be you. That's all you can be. That's don't a, worry about being like this person, that person, this person. That's such an important message. It's such a, but it's for it, girls definitely. For yeah, girls, definitely. I got my little girl. She's I can see her starting to have these tendencies now to like wanna like oh, you know oh so and so said this about me or so or I want or she's trying to fit in sort of speak a little bit, and uh, we her and I talk a lot about like daddy has one rule one rock solid rule in his house is find your joy, we find your joy. That's what you do. And then we and then we talk about consequences and we talk about responsibility. We talk about these things and we we talk through things. I don't just bark orders at her. We talk about things I, because I'm like you, man. Like my mother did that for me. My mother was not an emotional person. She sat down to Tad. I got it. she because she figured out <laughs> real fast. She said, "I said, Mom, before I had children, I said, Mom, you did such a great job. I said, What kind of advice do you have for me? Because I didn't have a father, and so all I had was, was a mother. So I said, well, What would you have? She said, Tad, you you and your brother were pretty easy, but but." said, your brother was super easy. All I had to do was give him a spanking, and he got it. He got the picture. He said, but you, I could whoop you and whoop you and whoop you, and it wouldn't make a difference. You just went ahead and did it anyways. And, <laughs> said, until I figured it out when you were about eight or nine years old. All I had to do was sit you down and talk to you and explain to you. You didn't have to agree. You just had to understand. And then right. you flew straight. It was easy. It was, and I didn't have no problem. So I do that with my daughter. She's like me. She's got to understand. 
when she doesn't understand, she's just going to find her way. She's going to challenge you. <laughs> and, or, or she'll be miserable. Right. You know, and I don't want her to be miserable. Gosh. Right. <laughs> did you now? Did you have a father? Did you grow up with a father? Family? Oh yeah, my, my dad. My dad. You know, he was he was your typical dad. He worked, you know, full time. So you know, depending on if you work night shift, depending on if you work day shift, it's depending on when I see him. But my dad has always been like supportive. Now he wasn't necessarily dis- 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 disciplinarian. Oh. <laughs> my mom was a disciplinarian. So my dad would have to, you know, to discipline me. Uh, I can always manipulate my way out of it, you know. I can talk to him about it. I can, I can act like, you know. I can always kind of get him. Most of the time, I can get him not to, not to get me in trouble, you know. So he, <laughs> Let's he, talk he, about he, this, Dad. Let's talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know. So most of the time, he was, he was, he was kind of cool like that. But you know, my dad is, is, uh, he's one of those people that, you know, he's a talented guy. Like he's a really talented guy, and he was, he was uh, always a uh, perfectionist. Oh. I used to, I used to, I used to not like that about my dad. Everything had to be clean. Everything had to be a certain way. And I'm thinking, I just didn't like that. Uh, but when I think about my dad, I think my dad, you know, he has a. He, if he really, really took the opportunity to do what he, I think he wanted to do, instead of you know just you know how we get stuck in a rut and we mm-hmm. follow the, we, the pattern of the, the just American society, work for corporations, work right. for this, work for that. We do what we have I to do. We say what we want to do. Right, right, because that's what you've been taught, you know. Right. You, you, you get the job. Like you get a good job, you know, you, this is what you do, this is what you do. Don't follow your, heaven would, forbid, don't follow your dreams. <laughs> if, you, if he would have went out the, outside the box a lot earlier in life, I think he would have been incredibly successful. But, you know, he kind of stayed in that safe box. What did he do and, when you were growing up? Well, he, he worked for, he, he, he was a manager supervisor at a plant, at the Nissan plant for like 11 oh, years. Oh, okay. Then he went to he went to Dale after that. So okay. now he's kind of doing his his own thing, you know. You know he's he like you know he dre- he dresses me basically. Like if you see me in anything, he 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 does my shopping because I don't I don't take the time to do shopping for the most part. Uh, my dad he'll <laughs> when I have my shows he would always go be my personal stylist, my dresser and everything. So he has different talents and he's he's you know he's good in the kitchen, he's good in all kind of different things. He's a really creative creative guy. But, you know, yeah, I look at my dad and say, man, and he was also a very fast guy. Oh. Very, very fast guy, but he never was an athlete. Really? Which is the craziest thing to me. I seen him, I seen him, he, he, we were at an event, he smoked all the day. <laughs> he just, I remember like, my dad, and, I can, and when I was growing up, I could never beat him in a race. <laughs> but I think my dad, he never did anything with it. Like, he never, he never, he never did anything. He was, I was like. Maybe, you, maybe you got some never, of your, maybe you got some of that athletic genetic potential from him. Right, you're right. Well, we're built totally different. Oh, really? Okay. He's 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 taller than me, and he has bigger joints. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, he's he's he, but he's he's always slim. He's not a fat guy. Right. So he he's, he has a hard time gaining weight. He's always slim, but you can see he has he has bigger joints than me. So I have the smaller body weight joints. He has more robust robust joints, and he's a little bit taller than me. But uh, yes, but we have <laughs> like we have clashing. We have slightly different personalities. But you know, it's just seeing my dad. You know. He's, it's just, it's perfection. Everything had to be this way, it had to be that way, had to be this way. And, you know, it's like uh, for me having to always know why and see a point. <laughs> he so, probably didn't like that. Class at that time, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different different than him. But you know, I look at my dad and I start talking. Man, my dad only just took some risks early. You know, he, you know, because he has a personality that he can get along with anybody. Oh wow! Er, cool. Everybody, er, everybody likes him. You know, he's like, oh, it's your dad. But, you know, it's just, I just feel like he's kind of got, if he just went out on a limb a little bit earlier, he would have he, he did some crazy things. But did, was your like, mother, what, was, what, what about your mother? What was she like? My mother was apparently a tough girl growing up. Oh, really? Wow. Look at my, look at my, listen to my uncles, you know, she's always, you know, she, you know, they grew up, she grew up in a family of eight, so she had a lot of brothers and sisters. And, you know, they, they grew up, uh, in the projects, but pretty successful in the project because my granddaddy was a hustler. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So my granddad, he had, you know, he, he used to have cash everywhere. Like he used to give me money for no reason. <laughs> money, you know. But uh, but you know, she had a lot of brothers and sisters, so she was like, you know, she was a, t- a tough girl. But she never did anything sports at Orient either. Oh. But I, I used to hate playing basketball with my mom because she was so rough. 
like she was so rough. She's too rough. For me. Like, oh, you, gotta, you gotta quit violent. You gotta quit being so aggressive, you know? And to this day, she like battles and she fights with my, you know, she, she'll fight and wrestle around with my, with my kids and, you know, everything. And she even do it with me sometimes, you know? She, she's got a lot of energy. A big personality kind of thing. She big? Is she tall as well? No, she's a short. She's a short. She's so she's oh. short. Yeah, she's uh, probably like five, five, five. No, five three or something like that. Okay. So she's a short lady. So, you know, it's uh, she's 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 a she's got a, a very big personality. You know, you, when my mom's around, you know, you know it. <laughs> and you know, she's just. You know, she's at a bodybuilding show. She's like swooning over all the guys. Ooh, look at that muscle. Ooh. <laughs> so, so she, she's something else, man. I love my mom. She's never a dull moment with, with my mom. You know? I like that. But, what about but your sisters? Yes. What about your Now, you say you had three sisters? Yeah, I had two sisters three years younger and okay. uh, three or four years younger. And, uh, you know, my dad didn't allow them to play sports when they grew up. Really? And uh, he didn't believe in girls playing sports. He's traditional, you know. Okay, He's really okay. traditional. And that's probably how he was raised, you know. But uh, he, so, so my sisters, they, they, they never were involved in anything sports-wise. But, you know, they're, they're really successful, really smart girls, you know, never really a problem. They used to always get me in trouble because I was the creative one, always doing stuff. And if something go wrong, I'm, I'm the one in trouble. You know? Were they, now, did you say they were older than you? No, they were younger than me. Oh, they were young. <laughs> they were coming, getting you coming up with games. I'm coming up with, you know, different things. And, you know, some of them get hurt. And then it was like, it's on me, you know. Trouble. So I had to learn how to separate myself so I would get in trouble. But my younger sister is the tough one. I taught her how to fight, wrestle. I taught her how to fight, you know, so she never had a problem with guys, you know. She even to this day would come up and get me in a chokehold and see if I can get out of it. <laughs> you know, you know she do that because, you know, I, ta I taught her. And she's like, yeah, she said, I did this on this guy when she was in college. It really works. It really worked. This really works. So she's she's uh she's she's a cool personality. And my, my middle sister, I used to battle with her a lot because she's my middle sister and I wanted a brother instead of a step sister at the time. So I probably treated my younger sister like the brother I never had. And my middle <laughs> sister I was I was kinda cause she was more like sensitive and uh, she always thought, you know, she always said everything was unfair. I always got my way. I always got to do this. That's the middle. That's the middle child syndrome. You yes, know that, right? You know, she's always complaining about the way my life was. You know, and, uh, <laughs> but but you know she's 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 a very smart smart woman. She's got like two kids now. My young sister doesn't have any kids, and you know she's successful. Her husband's a lawyer, and you know she's you know all my family. You know everybody's doing pretty good. Are they all in ten Are they all in Tennessee? Uh, everybody's in Tennessee, yeah. Wait, everybody. Now, where at in Tennessee? Because I... uh, Na Nashville is where we're from. Okay. Nashville is really where we're from. So, but my sister, my middle sister, she lives, Brittany, she lives in Murfreesboro. Okay. So she lives about probably like 10 minutes away from me. I'll tell you, I went and judged a show there, or, or actually, I was there at the uh, Flex's like, show. Ooh. Yeah. And, yeah. dude, I fell in love with Tennessee, with Na specifically in that Nashville area. I said, man, if there was somewhere else I was going to move, it would be someplace like this. Absolutely, man. I'm like. Man, I hear the story. I, you know, I've been there all my life, and that's what I, I hear story after story. I hear people that broke down in Nashville and then never left. <laughs> I mean, I've heard, I've heard this story more than once. I'm you know? not kidding, man. That is a, I not only do, not only were the people nice, I like the food, of course. You know, I, I kind of like southern. My, my family's from the south. I kind of like that. My at least my mother's side. I like the food, but I also I like the people. Like, and there's nothing. There's I gotta be honest, man. There's nothing like a woman with a southern accent. I'm sorry. I just think it's sexy. Okay, <laughs> that's just me. Okay, <laughs> but, yeah. but it that's was. What, that's why my wife. My wife had no problem coming coming to uh, to, to Nashville area because. You know, she's used to the Aloha spirit, you know, I mean, she's used to that, you know, so that Southern hospitality kind of reminded her of that, you know, and she's the one that got me to move back home, you know. Oh, really? I would have <laughs> yeah. thought she would want to go to Hawaii, like live in Hawaii, because... Well, you know, Hawaii is great, but, you know, it's... It it's is remote. Crowded. Everything's, everything's <laughs> overpriced, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. no, you, it's, like, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. if, if you If you're living on an island, you know, you don't have time to vacation, you got to work. Yeah, to make I, it, you know what I mean. <laughs> it is. It's sad. It's kind of sad because a lot of the locals they don't do well. Like you right. know, the, and so they always, you know, the, always trying to make you know enough money to make a living. You know, I mean, they get to go see the beach every once in a while. The weekends, you know, that's awesome. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, my my brother-in-law, he's doing really really well for himself. He just had his first first kid, but he works, you know, he works with uh, 
the Navy uh, oh, Air cool. Force on base with, with nuclear uh, submarines. Oh, wow. Uh, that's that's cool. He's, he's got a good little trade job he had at, right out of high school. So he's, he's paying him good money. And he married a, a, a woman that's, you know, she's very successful too. So they're doing great. They live on Honolulu, right? They live probably in Honolulu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. My father was born in Honolulu. So you were? my father was. Father. My father was born in Honolulu, and actually, all of my father's family are Hawa Native Hawaiian and Japanese. That's what I. So that's half of me, and uh, yeah. and that side of my family, they, they were all really wealthy. Like they had yeah. like farms in Kona and stuff. And my cousin was the late Senator Daniel Inouye. Uh, uh -huh. the, yeah, that was my cousin. So like, um, he, he died a couple years ago, but um, he was my cousin. So every time I go there. When they so I but as soon as I pay for something, they see my name. They're like, oh, are you related to the senator? I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's my cousin. You're like, yeah. <laughs> and then I get a story. You got the hookup, right? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't. But it, but I, I've always wanted to go there at, at some point in my life, and that's where I want to retire and like sort of be, um, because I just when I go there, man, I feel like I'm going home. Even though I didn't grow up there, because I, I was born in California, I didn't grow up right. there. I didn't like, you know, I was born in Inglewood. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> see, but see, bro, bro, I love it. I love it. I love it there. And I know, see, what was there? I think it was last spring. That was the last time I was there. Uh, but I, I love it there. But I visited so many times. But man, I mean, the island is, 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 is getting packed. I remember oh, really? leaving. We had a little birthday, uh, a birthday celebration for my wife at the beach with a couple of her friends there. And I remember leaving at the beach and going back to downtown. Uh, where we were staying, and um, well, not that wasn't it wasn't downtown, but we had a little drive, and it was the traffic was so oh, terrible. Man, yeah. It was so bad because so many people were trying to go. I mean, I, it's like I didn't rem I didn't remember it being so bad. <laughs> I didn't remember it, the upkeep of the foliage on the. Inter I noticed everything. The upkeep right. of the of the interstate the foliage and how it used to be, and I'm like, man, I you're like, man, things. It's just too many people. It's too many people on that one island, you know. It kind of takes away from from that, you know. I wanted to live, if I was going to go back, I would probably go to Kona. Like that's yeah, probably. Kona's Kona's definitely definitely yeah. where, you, where, I, where I think we'll be better. I, I, I just say, I love the island. I love I love the people. But man, it's just so, it's sometimes it's just too much. I mean, because we got so many people to see. I mean, right. you got so, many tracks, a, so much. Tracks. She has a big family there. I mean, she got so many, so many people there. Even though most of her brothers and sisters have moved off the island, oh, really? <laughs> you know, she's got she's from Wamanalo. She's just from a very, you know, sovereign town. So you know, it's so many, so much family, you know, family there. So you know, when we go, everybody wants to see us. You know, so it's uh, you know, I prep most of my my USA prep there. Oh really? Oh yeah. Hey, yeah. Man. <laughs> I used to wake up the roosters every morning. I know that well the chickens and shit that were just walking around yeah. everywhere. <laughs> I literally slept in, in the carport, you know, they call it the garage, but I literally slept in the carport because it was nice, you know. Oh right. And I get up, I do my cardio, and I'm walking along the strip. Everybody, everybody waving me when I go by. Isn't that nice? So I'm walking doing my cardio like this. <laughs> <laughs> you get some yeah. get a little bit of delt action there. <laughs> yeah, everybody drive her by because you know the town she lives in like, got two stoplights, you know. And well, uh she lives so out. Right, she she probably lived right outside of Honolulu or something. Is that where? Yeah, Wamanalo. Wamanalo. Wamanalo like okay. The first, like the first sovereign, sovereign town. In, uh, in nice. Oh first man. Landing. Right, right, like where the beach and the mountains are just right. I there. man, I, I when I <laughs> when I go there, I just my favorite island is uh, Kauai. Uh, you okay, know, yeah. yeah. I just you know not a lot of people. Um, right. You know, but it's romantic. But there's the waterfalls. But also because everybody knows each other and. You know, right. like you're not getting away with nothing over there. I'm sorry, like you're not. You know, it's like, and I, I kind of like that. Like, I like being able to leave my door open. You know, I don't right. want to. You know, and I want to yeah, like, uh, light, man. Yeah, That's like I light. truly believe in that Aloha spirit. Like I believe in that. Like I want to show love to everybody. I, it's not about me getting anything in return. It's about me feeling good. You know. That's what I love, man. I love when like it's it's, it's hard not to feel like, especially when you got you know, my wife's room. It's not hard for me not to feel at home when I'm there. Right. Just by the way, the feel of the people, the way they treat me, you know, the love, the love, man. It's just, it's just hard, you know. It's not, it's hard not to feel at home, you know. And, and it's not, I'm not like, you know, we don't hang around the tourist spots. We may visit right. here, have breakfast here, eat there. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm deep there. Even though her dad's not from there, he lived deep in, in Hawaii. Oh, really? We're all around Hawaii. <laughs> you know? He's like the only white man in the town. <laughs> <laughs> Mom was from the Big Island, so okay. 
was like, so it was, she has, she has so many cousins. And wow. Uncles. That's it's nice. Like, it's just great. Does she miss it? Does she miss it? Or does she, cause you said she of liked course, it. Of course, of course she misses it. You know, she, 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 she always, she told me as soon as I get back home, she, she, with or without me, she's done. <laughs> <laughs> I know she wants to see her brother's, uh, her brother's, her new niece though. Too. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's so, nice. So, but, so whether I go or not, I'm going, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> it's all good. I said, I know you need to go smell the ocean and, you know, cause she, so, you know she grew up surfing and everything. So oh, she, man, that's awesome. A while ago. That's what my dad, my mother told me, I didn't grow up with my father in the house, but um, I, he, when he, he grew up there in, on Honol in Honolulu and every, he was, he surfed every day and he actually was the world surfing champion in 1959. He surfed the pipeline. Oh, wow. uh, he had the longboards on the pipeline. Oh, and I was wow. like, wow, man. Like, and then he, his, but his dream was to get off the island. He's like, and my mother said, that's where, because that's how they met. They met in California. He wanted to move to uh, California, Southern California, and he wanted to marry a farm girl. And my mother is an Oregon farm girl. <laughs> so he did exactly that. And he wanted to race his, ra build engines and race race cars. He was a race car driver. That's what he did. And so that's what he did. That's exactly what he did. You know, you know, some people like that. Some people want to get off the rock. They want to get off. Some people are afraid to leave the rock. I met them too. They I, I've met guys that haven't even left their town. <laughs> in Hawaii, in Hawaii itself, you know? Well, those, I'm like, wow, they don't, even, they, don't even, they don't even want to go nowhere. Well, they say that 75% of the people you'll ever meet never move within 30 miles of where they were born. In Hawaii, that is true. <laughs> well, anywhere. The, in, your, your whole family, your whole family moves into one house out there a lot of Oh, times. wow. The whole family would be there. I mean, when I when I went out there with my wife, man, I heard everybody was living in the mom's house. Oh wow! Every family had a room. Everyone. <laughs> so it was like, and then they had neighbors that they've been neighbors for like twenty years, fifteen years. You know? Oh. <laughs> nothing, nothing changed, bro. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. It changed very slow. Very slow. I imagine it would be hard there. It would be hard to, for a lot of things to change. I, I would really like, uh, it would it would be nice to see that um, community there, the local community flourish a little bit more. I think it gets, you know, it was one of the few states that was annexed, right? We, we, we annexed that state. So it wasn't like they went willing, like they wanted to come and be in the United States. It was like it was annexed. So, so they, and the indigenous people, the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians, uh, kind of got the raw end of the stick, I think. Yeah, they um, got, definitely got the raw end of the stick. <laughs> You know? Yeah, <laughs> they still fighting to this day. <laughs> I know, man. Like one of the, I keep getting. Uh, you, well, you know Ernie. You know Ernie. Yeah, um, Ernie. Yeah. And so he, whenever he talks to me, he calls me senator because he knows my 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 cousin was a senator. Right. And he's like, uh, and he's and he and some other people are like, oh yeah, you gonna come and like run for office and stuff. I said, yeah, maybe that maybe I might because <laughs> every time I go there, that's really fun. But I would love to be able to participate in some way and do something good for the local community, not just the Hawaiians, but the people who live there locally. You know, like because. Yeah. They need it. I mean, they need it, man. Because in the wrong hands, you know, that island can just become a disaster. Because, yeah. You know, the wrong politicians in there, you know, there's too much self interest and business interest in the wrong, you know, the wrong. Because, you know, you got what? Who was it? Mark Zuckerberg? I mean, uh -huh. he has an there somewhere, right? So, yeah. He, he, he took a bunch of people's, apparently, he took a bunch of people's property. No <laughs> kidding. Damn. They let him, yeah, the government let him take a bunch of people. Like, these people had, like, well, I guess, land deeds, and it was so broken up. I guess in the oh, he bought them all bought out. out. They just he just bought it all out, and so these people they don't even have. They're, and there's so many protests going on. Even Monsanto's there. Oh the man, mountain, yeah. And they're trying to get him off. They protesting to this day about it. You know? There was a I don't know if you remember back in the '90s, uh, Steve Case who founded AOL. He when he sold out, he had billions of dollars. He went and bought a bunch of land right there in Kauai. And it was, and he ended up giving it to back get to the government and to preserve it because otherwise he knew, along with other people, they knew that look, man, they're gonna, it's going to get all touristy. They're going to just build stuff on it. It's going to destroy this natural land. And so I'm so glad that that happened. Um, so and kind of a there, it gives me hope. That there's <laughs> that there's good people out there in the world that want to do some nice things. You know, <laughs> yeah, you, gotta, you gotta preserve something like that because once those crazy once it's like yeah that, once it's gone, away, you can't get them back. Yeah, no, you it won't. Oh, it's gone, it's gone. You know, and then we have it's it's one of the, in my opinion, it's one of the few paradises out there that truly there's some you know. But I think that we make our own paradises as well you know, wherever we're at, and it, it exists right here in our heart. And uh, but it sure helps, man, when you have a nice beach to look at. And you have <laughs> nothing like it, bro. Nothing like it. 
I, when I went to the Maldives for like our anniversary, man, and, and it was just a small little island we were on. We had like a little villa, man, but it was like the best vacation of nothing that oh, we ever man. had. It's just <laughs> something about it, just being out the ocean and just just enjoying the elements, man. It's just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So does do you get a lot? Do you get um, your time there in Kuwait though? Because that's a different atmosphere too. When I went out there, um, one of the things that I recognized right away is that um, when I went to the gym, I had that. By the way, that I went to the bigger one, the bigger oxygen okay. gym, with the four levels. That's a kick-ass gym, man. Probably the best gym I've seen in the world. Um, but I'm like, I'm looking around. <laughs> And I'm like going, dude, that, something's missing, man. And like, yeah, man, there's no women here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, no, no. they work out somewhere else. I was like, oh, shit. I'm like, so, but that was a big change for me because some of that, you know, was kind of motivating. I was, I don't, I'm not one of those people that like, you know, I, when I go to the gym, I go there to, to train. Uh, I don't really do a, I don't really, you know, like pick up on girls and shit like that. That's not my thing. But, uh, uh, but I do, um, but I do think um, like that was a, different for me to experience that. And then when I went to the mall, like, uh, you know, Sager, he, he took us to the mall. He's like, oh, I want to show you these malls. And, he, and, he, and, we, and I'm like, you get like, I, how do I, how do I put this? It seemed like the, the women, were, like they don't, they don't look you in the eyes and it's the Muslim culture. You know, it's very different. And so I totally get how it can keep somebody focused. <laughs> but I was, I was, hey bro, it, it, it's so strange. Like you walk, you walk by a woman and she won't even like make God's contact with you. She won't even look at you. But it's something different about being in a car. Okay. I don't know. I've got I've gotten honked at. I've gotten raised <laughs> at when the woman is in a car. But really? When she's out in the open and everybody can see her. She, you're not gonna you're not gonna get any. Uh, oh wow. Out. But if they're in a the car. I guess they feel secure in the car. They may wave. They may smile. You know. <laughs> you know wow. They get if they're out and people can see them, then you know, forget it. Get yeah. You don't exist. <laughs> That's it's interesting. Strange. One of the things when we were driving around, I remember um, I was like, uh, I was like, do these people have ro- laws on the road? <laughs> I was like, yeah. he's like, yeah, man. We were just forcing our way in, and everybody seemed to know what to do. Everybody seemed right. to know what to do. Like it was the most. Thick, right? I'm like, dude, this dude's like three inches from your car, bro. I was like, I was like, yeah, they he's like, no, nah, they do, man. It's like it's wild, you know. But such a nice people. Everybody I met. They were so nice, um, and I that I did appreciate. And but I but I'm always looking for the best of people. I admit, I admit. You know, Kuwait is you know they've been real supportive, and real nice with me out here. So I can't I can't really complain about that. I mean, I mean you be out and about, people want pictures. You know, they they. Oh, that's some cool. Even, some even the domestic guy workers and the guys that you know just they come in for work. They just freak out, you know, depending on where they're from. They can get a dash or you know, wherever they that was, they, oh, muscles. They stop that, that was that was amazing. I, I I never would have guessed that the local people and people in the Middle East in that part is also India, but but specifically in the Middle East, in Kuwait and Dubai and all these places, they just go nuts over bodybuilding. They love it. They absolutely love it. I was like, wow, I did no idea, right? Like, because we get in our own little world. Here in the United States, we think the world fucking revolves around us, right? Like, it's like about us, right? <laughs> but there's a whole other world out there of whole different kinds of people, and they actually like some of the same shit that we like. <laughs> it's like <laughs> to, to a great degree. I mean, they, the, the masculine the masculine kind of society of building your body, the muscles, you know, they, they, they're really into it. They're really into that culture here. It's like, I mean, you know, what they pay here for, a gym membership, you know? Oh, man, like, I know. You can't get nobody to pay like that in America. Nobody I mean, I, I know I was... When I was talking, I had Jay Cutler on the show, and, I, and I, he asked, "Where do you work out?" And I said, "Oh yeah, I work at Lifetime Fitness." He's like, "Oh man, that's like 120 something dollars a month." He's like, "Fuck that!" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." I, I kind of like my towel service. I'm kind of pampered. I, I kind of like a yeah, few little nice. Right? But but yeah, but over there it's kind of standard. Like what's like I think he I think uh, Bader said it was like he charges like I think 150 190 dollars a month something like that. And uh, and I'm like, man, I'm like, nobody was gonna pay that, like here, like they're not gonna pay that here, you know. He's got four gyms, man. Oh, I know, I know. He told me 15, the numbers. He, Fifteen like, minutes away from each other, bro. I know. He he told me that he had like forty something thousand uh, members total in his. I was like, oh my god. And I started doing the math. I'm like, dude, bro, that's you're banking. That's awesome. <laughs> Fifteen minutes away from each other, bro. The Kuwait's not big. No. So there's everybody must work out. All the guys, man, they love it, man. The gyms are always busy, bro. <laughs> so when you came over there, did everybody, were you you got a very warm reception, I, I imagine. Yeah, man. It's, it's, I mean, and, and then think about it. 
about the culture that shocked me, man. Everybody just leaves their stuff around, you know? So you got you got a cafe full of bags, people leave their wallets out. Nobody cares. People don't really take stuff around here. It's weird. Don't do that here in Chicago. Yeah, you can't you can't do that. Like I could leave something in in the, in the gym and I'll be like, I'll go back and get it later. I can go back and get it later. <laughs> wow. You know? Like people leave their bags and stuff in their own. Do you think that's like, Do you think that's a uh, Do you think that's reflective of the the moral temperature there, or is it something else? It's got to be. It's got to just be the culture. I mean, I, I mean, because here, man, we got so, here here I, in the I states. Guess, we, I guess there's not a lot of people. You know, I don't think there are a lot of people like in serious need here. You know, you're not going to see any homeless people on the way. Right. It's just not. You know, if anybody's here, they're here to work. And, you know, the Kuwaitis, they don't have to worry about anything. The government, they, you know, make sure the Kuwaiti people are good. Yeah, they get that. They get a monthly stipend. He, I, Sager told me all about it. I was like, damn, that's awesome, bro. <laughs> you, you, born in, it's, you born in Kuwait, it's like a country club. You know? Kuwait, you know, it's, you, you're taken care of. You don't have to worry about nothing, you know? He, yeah, he so was telling you. I don't think it's just got that mentality where people just feel like they got to take something from somebody. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. It's nice. I, I, because man, here in Chicago, man, like I moved to Chicago a year and a half ago. Man, you can't do that, man. I'm sorry, man. They'll take you. They'll take it out of your pocket if you can. <laughs> like, I don't know. And it maybe, and maybe you know, you know, maybe you know, the the the, uh, the uh, repercussions are, are are bad enough that people just don't want to take that risk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> I do think there's something to be said for, you know, you meet people's basic needs and they'll be, most people will be good. They'll be moral. You know, I think that's the, I really do believe that. I think that, but when people's, when people don't feel like their basic needs are being met, then you start running into some problems. You know, uh, people are going to, we all, that's why I'm a big advocate of socialized healthcare and all these, because I really believe that, man, we got to meet people's basic needs all over the world. And I, I'm a, I'm a person that believes in a global community. I'm not one of these I don't, I'm not a big person that's like, America first. No, man. America shouldn't be first. America should be with everybody else. That's what I think. That's my personal belief. I think that we should, we should think of ourselves, as, then the, the people that are going to be thinking of, of ourselves within a global context, they're the progressive thinkers. They're the people who are going to be, or, or who are going to change the world in the better ways. And who are gonna, that's, I think that's the direction we're going between the economies and between our cultures. We have to do this. Like, and it follows suit with, the, the spirit of aloha, it follows suit with all these things. Like, we all need to just like, I mean, I hate to sound like a hippie, but we all need to like love each other a little bit more, man. Like have some caring, right? That's, that's great. That's great. But the only thing I, I, I will say is we don't need, we don't need a select group of people making all the decisions for everybody. No, no. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I agree about that. I agree. That, that is the only thing I worry about with, with, uh, with uh, certain you know, because we we as human beings have a tendency to give everything away to somebody we think uh, is better or on a better platform than us. You know? Sure, sure, sure. We're like we, we give all, you know, we, we'll give our rights away. And <laughs> so, you know, for for safety, we'll give our rights away. I agree. You know, one, I agree, hundred no percent. So that's the only thing we have to worry about when it comes to making sure we don't give over too much of the power of the people. In it as, as well, as then you we run the risk of. Really, there's some dictatorship issues. There's right. all kinds of issues like people get taken because you know, when you when too much power exists in a localized, you know, right. individual or set of individuals, lots of indiscretions happen. You know, people right. look out right. for they're self interested. You know, and they want you know they want okay. money and power, money and power. Money Together and power. but separate is always you know it's always good because you have checks and balances. Yes, that have to exist because you know at, at the end of the day. <laughs> We can't find a perfect system. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a, it never will be one. Yeah, it's a constantly <laughs> evolving thing. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's no. Well, it's because we're not. That's because we're not perfect. <laughs> right. So the diversity, uh, the little diversity, is always is always what's gonna I, balance. I just balance think it. that um, when it comes to like looking at us, uh, we need uh, you know Americans or or any set of individuals, whether it doesn't matter what country. That we we should be more inclusive, um, and that means that yeah, we, should, we should we should get to understand each other from yes. a different point of view. Yes, because I think that's the biggest thing about Americans outside of America that people Americans don't know in, within America is that we get looked at a certain way. Mm -hmm. And you know, what was and, it, what did they? How did they see you? Like I'm curious, like being an American, being in. Well, in, fortunately for me, fortunately for me, I, I don't I don't immediately wear that American flag the way I'm right. immediately identified as American. They have to add some pride. 
and say, oh, well, oh, you're, you're, oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, know? you know, because, because, you know, until, until they know, you know, you know, until they actually know, then if they have a pre- preconceived notion, it's a different story. They, okay. they, they may not, they may not be the nicest person to you depending on where they're from. Oh, really? Okay. You know? but if, they, <laughs> but if they get to know you first and they get to experience, then they, then you tell them you're from America, then they, then they realize, okay, maybe not all Americans think they're superior to everybody right. and, you know, thinks everybody owes them something or, you know, or, or have no actual world worldview and <laughs> think they know everything about the world, you know, based on the news that they watch, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know, we, we sometimes uh, the rest of the world could be perceived as uh, very ignorant. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I think we are very centric. Uh, most right. people, many, many, not everybody, but many Americans, very centric. And we kind of think of right. ourselves, We, like I said, we think we everything revolves around us. <laughs> right. um, and it's so, most... So with, but they do have a stereotype. Oh, really? What's the, st- what's the stereotype? What's the stereotype? Well, you know, man, it's, it's kind of, you don't fit the profile. Oh. Uh, I don't necessarily fit the profile, but we kind of, we kind of, if we watch TV, television, we kind of can find that profile that they kind of expect. That's kind of what they're given, this profile. Okay. They expect and they look for. So if you fit that profile, then they're already they already turning their nose up at you. Oh wow, wow! You know, if you're loud, if you're if you're overweight, if you're, if you're, <laughs> you know it's, it's it's interesting, you know, because I only know this by talking to people. Oh really? So, yeah, I was well, expecting you to be like this, and expecting you to look at, you know, have this opinion or. Or you know, you know <laughs> think of things like this, and I'm just like, nah, no. Nah, I'll just be honest. Not every America's a very broad space. And we have a lot of places that are just totally different from each other. And that means it's a lot of people that are just totally different from each other. And right. have different opinions. So what you may view from maybe a mainstream perspective may not be what you get out of every every American in general. So, <laughs> I mean, this is this is from flight attendants to you know, to, to people that <laughs> apparently work with uh, with our uh, American people on a regular basis. They have these preconceived notions. I guess. Based I can on, I can see why. I mean, I can certainly see why. <laughs> so now, so, but, but but you know, it's it's like that in all countries. Even in the Middle East, uh, they have their opinions of their neighbors, and and you know, or you know, they, their neighbors, their cousins. They have their <laughs> Frequency notions. I'll tell you one thing, man. When I when he showed me, Sager took me to his house and showed me, and then he showed me some, and I'm like, everything, all those homes, man, they look huge. <laughs> <laughs> they look nice and they look huge. I'm like, damn, dude, this is. A... <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah we yeah. everybody gets one. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I was like, damn, I need to be a queen. Separate living quarters, you know. You know you got yeah, there were levels. And children, and then your man's got his own. Yeah, he's like my my, my mom and her her. She, they live on this level. We live on this level. I'm like, wow, man, that's awesome. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's crazy. Right? It is, man. It's like there is a different world out there. Um, so switching gears a little bit before we end this uh, our our interview here, but what uh, are so you going to be at the Arnold? And uh, I'm excited to see you there. Um, what uh, tell me? Give me a little bit of what we can expect, or at least, uh, or what do you? What, what what's your expectation? Well, as as of right now, man, uh, we, we feel like we're coming in uh, even more improved from the Olympia. We feel like uh, this prep is going. You look great at the Olympia, going, by the way. Going very very good. I mean, we, we we made some tweaks, and I just think you're gonna find a more complete physique, a little bit more muscle maturity, and, and I think the condition is gonna be uh, better and better for this show. The way things are going, so we were very, very confident going into the show. I just, it's been, uh, it's not been a strenuous prep, but it's just like everything's been. We've been working the way we need to work, and my coach is on it. Man. He's, he's laid out the game plan, and uh, and you know, people look at me on a regular basis and say, "I'm oh, in the shows next week." No, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> is that the yeah. is that is that the biggest difference? Like, what's the biggest difference for you? Walking into the Arnold this year versus walking into the Olympia or any other uh, pro show that you've done the last year. Well, you know, you know, you know, walking to the Olympia, you expect, you know, I was expecting this fight for the top five, which we, you know, we definitely did. But you know, we went to the Arnold, and we were expecting to you know, have our title. You know, but that's awesome. That's just that's what we're looking for. You know, that's what we want to do. And I, I just, you know, we've we studied and we've we've looked at, you know, everything that's ahead of us and. Just don't see, you just don't see that as a far reach. No, 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 no. no. Okay. I don't. Yeah. I, I personally don't see it. I, I personally don't see that as a far reach. I see it as a very distinct possibility. I think that 
the only advice I would say is put it in your mind and don't let it, don't let it move. It's, it's in our head. It's in yeah. our, definitely in our heads. And, you know, we get, we, we get confirmation of, of you know, how, the possibility each and every day. Good. Each and every day. So it's just like you know, walk into it. You know, just uh, you know, keep this mind frame, keep this this uh, this, this focus, and uh, you know, just try not to mess anything up. Have you been? <laughs> <laughs> you won't. You won't. You won't. Um, have you been out to see Jim? Has he asked to come see? Has he asked to see you yet, or anything like that? Uh, uh, to, to see Jim? No, he hasn't asked to see. We've got some. You know, we of course, apparently, my coach has some things in the background, things floating around. In people's opinions and different good, things. good, 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 good. good. Not, nothing but good, but good <laughs> information coming from him. So he's he gets excited and every and every day. He called me. He called me uh, tonight. He got a phone with Bill Heath apparently. And, oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So some good things. And so he's 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 behind the scenes talking to people <laughs> and, and getting his updates. So we'll probably see Steve uh, before. Okay. Uh, before, before I think a little fly out and see New York. Right before we go to Columbus. So okay, probably, cool. Oh, oh, Alright, Steve, make sure. He, I believe, though he's seen some things that I heard. So. <laughs> well, man. So we'll be in New York anyway. we got to stop there. So. Well, man, I am excited to see you on stage. I'm excited to see you again at the Arnold. I'll see you there when I uh, when you're there. I'll see you there backstage and stuff. And and I'm rooting for you. You know that. You know I. You know I think the world of you, man. Not only as a person, but as a bodybuilder, uh, and now as a father, and 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 also as a husband. I think uh, you're 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 a wonderful representation of what a good champion should be like. So thank. Good job, man. Good job. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just a human man. I'm learning like everybody else, man. So. That's exactly. That's all it takes, right? Well, I will again. Like I said, it'll be, I guess, just a little less than a month. Um, I'll see you. So let that excitement build, man. Dream, dream, dream big. Dream about winning, because I want to. I'd love to see you grab that trophy in, uh, with the, uh, in the winner's circle. I, I, you got it within you. I know you do. So, <laughs> Um, I'll see. So I'll see you in a month. If you, let everybody know where they can reach you if you if you, if you want them to reach you. <laughs> the easiest place is Instagram. You know, Brandon double underscore two two underscores Curry. That's probably the easiest way to reach me. I'm, I'm on it consistently, and um, I got to keep up with the messages. Otherwise, I'll, I'll be way behind. <laughs> so, you know, just hit me up on there, guys. Keep on following me. I'll put some progress stuff up that I'm allowed awesome. to. You know, so. I like that you're. I like. I like that you've been more uh, vocal and more visible. In the last couple of years, and you have been in previous years, um, it's I, I I make it a point to tell a lot of the pros that I interact with, like it's so important, like in the space that we live in today, in the bodybuilding industry today, versus you know years ago, you really have to be a little visible. You have to be a little more accessible. It's hard. I can't I can't lie. It was hard for me to make the transition. You know, coming from the magazine era, I know to the social media era, it was it was a struggle. My wife had to literally just beat this into my head. <laughs> it so so she finally you know she, she kind of got me uh you know just routine into it and enjoying the process have, and looking at it from a different perspective exactly have fun with it like this is a, it's adding that let it add value and then if it's yeah. the stuff that doesn't you just kind of push that aside <laughs> so, I, was, right. I was totally old school <laughs> that's okay that's okay well, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you, man. When, when I when I see you there, we'll take a picture, man, and I'll, we'll be, I'll be able to say hi to you. And then, of course, hopefully I'll be able to shake your hand in the winter circle. Of school. <laughs> is your wife going to be there? Is Brandy going to be there? Oh, yeah. She's going to be there. The kid's going to be there. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'll say hi to them, too. Well, you when, And you'll say hi to them before then. Tell her I said hi and wish them the best for me. And then, of course, I'll see you guys in a month, okay? All right, bro. Appreciate All right, brother. You, thank you. Handle your high with Daddy Yoshi.